chair recognize the chair recognizes the member from Auburn, Representative Wasburn, moves the House adjourned from the session of March 21st, 2024. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed nay, the ayes have it and the House is adjourned. The House will attend to a prayer by guest chaplain, Rabbi Daniel Aronson of Congregation Ahavas Ahim in Keene. Spirit of wisdom, kindness, and justice, wellspring of life, love, and community. You who are known by many names and are beyond all names. We ask your blessings on the families of the six public workers who perished in the Key Bridge tragedy and we join our hearts with the people of Baltimore and Maryland. And we ask your blessings on the New Hampshire House of Representatives as it adjourns to do the people's business this day. May these legislators govern justly, disagree with civility, and lead with humility, seeking to understand before insisting to be understood, treating one another with the dignity and respect they wish for themselves. Remind them that all human beings, near and far, are neighbor and sibling, gay, straight, transgender, male, female, black and white, Hispanic and Asian, Muslim, Jew, Christian, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, and atheist, and yes, Democrat, Republican, and Independent. Let them heed the calls of prophets throughout the ages to respect and protect the most vulnerable among us, our children, the elderly, the poor, those who are hungry, those who have no homes, those who are ill in body, mind, and spirit, the strangers and immigrants in our midst, those who live on the margins, those who are alone, those who are forgotten. Grant these elected officials the wisdom and courage to know and do what is right and good and true. To borrow the words of Father Greg Boyle, May they strive to create a community of kinship and an ever-widening circle of compassion. May they abandon the idea that there is us and them, for ultimately, there is only us, one humanity, only us. Source of goodness, we pray that the work of their hands prosper for the sake of all granite staters and their neighbors and siblings everywhere. And let us say, Amen. Amen. The chair recognizes a member from Raymond, Representative Tim K. Hill, will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The chair now recognizes Jana L. C. A. of Raymond, who will sing our national anthem. Oh, sir, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air. that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star 
star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. The House will tend to request for leaves of absence. Mr. Speaker, the day, illness, Representatives Gibbs, Harley, Montiel, James Murphy, Finney, Trelevin. The day, important business, Representatives Bruyard, Mason, Sanborn, True, and Varney. The day, illness in the family, Representative Ming. These leaves will be granted unless otherwise ordered by the House. The House will attend to the introduction of guests. Mr. Speaker, please welcome Anna Buxton, student from Bedford High School, our page for the day. Welcome to the New Hampshire House. Mr. Speaker, please welcome Christine Kamal, Ed Remittis, Cindy Roning, and Julia Moss and Steed, guests of Representative Abair. Brenda Wolf and Sue Young, guests of Representative Tim Cahill. Tara Painter and Philip and Emmett Ray Clancy, guests of Representatives Tony Lekas and Alicia Lekas, and the Honorable Melbourne Moran, former member from Nashua, and Lisa Simmons Moran, guests of Representative Greg. They are with us in the gallery today. Well, <clears throat> welcome to the New Hampshire House. The House will attend to a memorial resolution. Mr. Speaker, House Resolution 34. The House will be in order. Whereas we have learned with profound sorrow of the death of our friend and colleague, Arthur S. Ellison, who is serving his third term as a state representative representing the citizens of Merrimack County District 28, wards 1, 2, and 3 of the City of Concord. And whereas a dedicated civil servant, Arthur Ellison worked for 38 years in the Department of Education, where he made a verifiable difference in the lives of countless Granite Staters. And whereas Art Ellison served the entirety of his legislative career on the House Education Committee, where he was known as a consummate professional, who while passionate in his beliefs and advocacy, was never disagreeable and was a pleasure to work with. And whereas Art Ellison's skill at organizing with the State Employees Association and within his caucus was acknowledged by his appointment as an assistant Democratic leader. And whereas, above all, Art Ellison was a devoted husband, father, and grandfather who spoke lovingly of his family and his joy in being in their company as he bravely faced his illness. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the House of Representatives in regular session convened. Arthur S. Ellison be granted the highest praise and accolades and our profound thanks for his service to his state and the city he called home for many years. And be it further resolved that expressions of our most heartfelt sympathy be extended to his family and that a suitable copy of this resolution be prepared for presentation to them. Please join and rise in honor of Representative from Concord, the Honorable Art Ellison. The House will now attend to the consent calendar. Chair recognizes the clerk. Mr. Speaker, in a letter dated March 27, 2024, Dear Paul, please be adv advised that the following representatives elect were sworn into office by the Governor and Council on this day Rockingham County, District Number 21, Jennifer Mandelbaum of Portsmouth, Stratford County, District Number 11, Eric Johnson of Lee. Sincerely, David M. Scanlon, Secretary of State. Let's welcome our new colleagues to the New Hampshire House. The 
House will attend to the consent calendar. Mr. Speaker, from the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety, House Bill 1711, removed by Representatives Hull, Tom Mannion, McCarter, Cushman, Jonathan, Smith, Prout, Gerhard, Kelly, Potenza, and Comtois. From the Committee on Transportation, House Bill 1637, removed by Representative Sykes, Rombo, Plamondon, St. Clair, Almy, Foote, Drew Fox, Corman, Gorski, and Jones. Are there any of the bills be removed from consent? Representative Osmond moves the consent calendar with the relevant amendments as printed in the day's House record be adopted. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the consent calendar is adopted. The House will now attend to the regular calendar. Majority of the <clears throat> Committee on Commerce and Consumer Affairs to which was referred House Bill 1365, an act relative to substitution of biological products by pharmacies. Consider the same, report the same with the following amendment, and a recommendation of the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Keith Ammon from the minority of the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, will report with a recommendation of the bill be referred for interim study. Representative Tim McGoo for the minority of the committee. The amendment is 1243H, printed in House Record 12, page 145. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is on to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety, to which was referred House Bill 1366 FN, an act relative to penalties for the negligent or reckless operation of boats. Consider the same, report the same with the following amendment. And the recommendation the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Terry Roy for the committee. The amendment is 0111H, printed in House Record 12, page 145. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Majority of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety, to which was referred House Bill 1539 FN an act relative to annulling, representing, or discontinuing prosecution of certain cannabis offenses. Consider the same, report the same with the recommendation the bill ought to pass. Senator Jonah Wheeler from the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following resolution resolved that is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Jonathan Smith from the minority of the committee. The chair recognizes Representative Rhodes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Colleagues, I recognize my friend from Peterborough's passion about this particular piece of legislation. And the fact of the matter is, regardless of what any of us feel about the possibility of cannabis becoming legal in New Hampshire, it is not, as of now, legalized. And this bill aims to make an annulment process basically a blanket for anybody that may have had a prior conviction because of cannabis. We hear thousands of bills in the House, many that will never become law. Just because this subject is being discussed does not mean that that's going to happen. Additionally, the way this bill is written, it will put the erroneous on the New Hampshire families to be responsible for the annulment process. I find it really hard to believe that any of us should have to pay for someone else's annulment hearing. We didn't do the crime. At the time of these convictions, cannabis was illegal, and it still is. This does not take any of that into effect whatsoever. 
RSA 651 has a very defined process for annulments that is working. My suggestion is, if we want to streamline the process if and when cannabis becomes legal, then let's put that language into one of the cannabis bills, not a whole separate piece of legislation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair, recognize Representative Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The current process for annulments has people paying $300 to request a hearing to get their conviction annulled. And as we discuss here in this body the legalization, and not just legalization, but sale of cannabis, where the state will be selling this drug, I and the 14 members of the Criminal Justice Committee who voted ought to pass on this legislation felt that it was an egregious wrong that we should be discussing the legalization and sale of cannabis while people are stopped from getting loans or getting jobs or moving forward in the process of rehabilitation because of a cannabis conviction on their record. The bill before us, HB 1539, would set up a process by which the Department of Safety would observe all the people in their records and see if anyone meets the criteria of solely a cannabis conviction, and that would then be eligible for an annulment hearing. That doesn't guarantee that you're going to get an annulment. It guarantees you a hearing. Some people deserve an annulment. Some people might not. The legislation is very clear, and I think the majority report handles this well. Nobody who has pled down from a crime which was more than solely the cannabis charge is eligible for the hearing. They aren't eligible to get the annulment. Nobody who had gotten a cannabis conviction above the limit that's put forth in the bill can get even a hearing. And the bill does not say that people are automatically eligible for annulments. It says that you're able to get your hearing. And I think uh, a fair process before the courts, uh, just demonstrating that you have re rehabilitated yourself, demonstrating that you are on the process to rehabilitation, uh, showing that you want to get a job, you want to get a loan for whatever that business that you want to start is or the school that you want to go to is, and making sure that you can live a full life. That's what HB 1539 is. So I appreciate the passion from my friend from the minority of the committee on this legislation, but I would ask the House to consider the fact it's a little hypocritical for us to be discussing uh, the sale of cannabis at the same time as there are people who aren't able to get uh, a hearing because they can either not meet the $300 payment or they aren't aware of the eligibility of the process right now. We've seen across the country people who are eligible for annulments, out of the 100% of people who are eligible for them, only 6% of people actually pursue them. And we're seeing that here in New Hampshire as well. This legislation would address that hypocrisy and would address that dichotomy. And I ask you to join the 14 to 6 majority ought to pass vote on this legislation. It's not about whether or not you support cannabis legalization. I can guarantee you that the 14 members who voted for this bill not all of them supported legalization. This is about whether or not you want the state to be hypocritical in how it enforces convictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I ask you to join me and ought to pass on this legislation. Will the member yield to questions? I will. Member yields. Jen Harrigan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative, for taking my question. It, it was stated previously that cannabis is still illegal in New Hampshire, but it, isn't it true that it's now a civil offense and the people we're talking about having a chance to get rid of their convictions were convicted as a, of a criminal offense, and that's a major difference in the law that's changed? That is a, a great point, Representative. Representative Granger has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. I will reemphasize that when I ask for a second on a roll call, you need to be in your seats.
also be in order. The motion before us, Majority Committee Report of Order Pass on House Bill 1539. This is a roll call vote. The Chair recognizes Representative Rhodes for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the way this bill is written, it's going to put the, the liability on the New Hampshire taxpayers to have to be responsible for other people's annulments, and if I know at the time that this, that this was illegal and that the law was broken, would I vote no on the off pass motion? Chair recognized Representative Newell for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that cannabis convictions not only create harm in the sentence, but long-lasting harm in seeking employment, housing, and more, well after an individual's punishment has been completed, and if I know that, as a state, currently in the process of legalizing cannabis, acknowledging the benefits, including a hefty financial benefit, should be actively seeking to relieve the burden imposed on those individuals harmed throughout the prohibition years, would I now push the green button in favor of ought to pass? The motion before us is the Majority Committee Report of Auto Pass, House Bill 1539. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend to stay to the vote. Two hundred and eighty three voting nay, eighty voting nay. Committee report is adopted. Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety to which was you. Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety to which was referred House Bill 1713FN, an act relative to a defendant's presence during criminal proceedings, having considered the same, report the same, the following recommendation the bill ought to pass. For what reason does a member rise? To make a motion. State your motion. To table HB 1713. To table? Table. The motion is to table House Bill 1713. Representative Granger has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is not sufficiently seconded. This will be a division vote. The division has been requested. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1713. 
This is going to be a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Poole for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this forces someone who is still innocent until proven guilty to show up in court prematurely, if I know that this could be used to weaponize the court process for someone who's been accused of a crime but not found guilty, would I now vote yes on the table motion? Chair, recognize Representative Roy for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that everything the previous speaker just said would be uh, made moot by the um, floor amendment that w I'd love to get to, and if you care about giving victims a chance to be heard for their victim witness statements, would I then vote to stop this tabling motion so that we quickly move on and look at the floor amendment? Thank you. The motion before us is a table House Bill 1713. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, the House will tend to stay the vote. 112 voting nay, 256 voting nay, tabling motion fails. Representative Roy offers floor amendment 1367H. It's in your seat pockets and is recognized to speak to his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, after filing this bill with the Honorable um, Speaker Emeritus, um, we looked at it, we discussed it with the uh, various members of this body, and we heard you. Um, it was overly broad, and it could be used to make someone show up if they didn't want to as part of their defense. Having said that, this floor amendment only does this. The defendant has to show up in court for the reading of the verdict and for the sentencing. Again, for the reading of the verdict and the sentencing. If the jury spends the time to hear this case, the defendant should take the time to go in and respect that jury and hear their verdict, and he darn sure should show up for his sentencing. That's the only times they have to appear in court. I'd ask you to pass this amendment and the underlying bill. Thank you. The motion before us is the Roy Floor Amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it and the floor amendment is adopted. Chair recognizes Representative Pelosoff. We're now on the motion, ought to pass as amended. He's waving off. Representative Roy is waving off. Representative Granger had requested a roll call on this. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is not sufficiently seconded. This will be a voice vote. The motion before us is ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1713. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. Aye. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Ought to pass as amended. Committee on Education to which was referred House Bill 1014 relative to registration of high school students to vote. It comes to us without recommendation. Representative Hall moves ought to pass. Representative Cordelli moves amendment 
159H, printed in House Record 12, pages 44. Chair recognizes Representative Hall to speak against the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, I rise in opposition to Amendment 1159H. One would hope that an amendment to a bill would make it better. In this case, it does not. In fact, it does nothing to address the intent of House Bill 1014 to encourage student voter registration and civic engagement, which is a challenge given that in the 22 midterms, only 15.6% of New Hampshire 18-year-olds registered to vote. 15.6%. This amendment includes what is already in statute, that civics instruction must include teaching about the role, opportunities, and responsibilities of a citizen to engage in civic activity. The amended language requires that election and voting laws also be included in the civics curriculum, which I would argue is already included in the law. However, what is problematic in the, is that the amendment strikes out the entire language on voter registration, which requires each school district and private high school to adopt a policy with provisions for informing eligible students about voter registration laws and for filing voter registration applications. It's important to note that promoting registration is key to encouraging young students to vote. Civics credits can be earned in grades 9 through 12, which means that some students are 14 or 15 years old while enrolled in their civics class. Receiving a copy of the Constitution and being taught about voting and election laws in ninth grade is vastly different than three years later when students are old enough to apply their knowledge to a real world situation, that is, registering to vote if they so choose. This amendment completely negates the intent of House Bill 1014 to increase New Hampshire student voter registration and to encourage more youth civic engagement. Please vote no on this amendment so that a better motion can be made. And Mr. Speaker, I ask for a division vote. Thank you. Chair recognize Representative Cadelli. What? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Represent Representative. Chair recognize Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The bill as introduced burdens municipal staff, mainly town clerks and supervisors of the checklist, as well as places mandates on struggling school districts. The amendment, however, removes the burden by removing the mandate. Also, the amendment addresses a number of concerns raised by the Secretary of State's office. Specifically, registration drives must be open to the public and be accessible to the elderly, people with disabilities, people with physical handicaps, and are otherwise medically fragile. These vulnerable populations would be effectively disenfranchised if House Bill 1014 were to pass as introduced. Finally, the amendment adds that New Hampshire laws surrounding voting be included in the civics curriculum, which is under development as a result of Senate Bill 216 being signed into law last year. Therefore, press the green button to adopt the amendment. Thank you. A division has been requested. Members, take your seats.
The motion before us is the amendment 1159H. This is a division vote. Chair, recognize Representative Woodcock for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this amendment does absolutely nothing to improve the bill, it's just a waste of taxpayers' money, and if I know that the request to add information on election law is already part of the curriculum in civics today, and if I know by way of reminder that this amendment does absolutely nothing, I wish you'd vote no on the amendment. Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Pinnerno for a parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Speaker, if I know that this amendment clarifies an RSA from 1937 by referencing it in RSA 18911, which is Instruction in National and State History and Government and Civics, if I know that all high school students should know how to register to vote, and if I know that all students should know the laws governing elections and voting, would I now press the green button? The motion before us is Amendment 1159H. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, House will tend to say the vote. 189 voting nay, 186 voting nay. The amendment is adopted. So the motion before us now is ought to pass as amended. Right, the motion before us is ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1014. Are you ready for the question? All, well, all those in favor say aye. Aye! Those opposed nay. The ayes have it. The Committee on Education to which was referred House Bill 1015FN relative to requirements for literacy skill development in elementary grades. This comes without recommendation. Representative Balboni moves ought to pass and offers amendment 1106H printed in House Record 12, pages 44. Chair recognizes Representative Cascadin for speak for the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, I urge you to vote OTPA on 1106 on House Bill 1015 for what's best for kids. 
House Bill 1015, Amendment 1106H is a bipartisan bill. It's amended by two professional educators who have many years of experience teaching students how to read. Excellent literacy instruction builds a strong foundation of learning. It's our collective responsibility to advocate for, ensure, and protect these rights for every child, everywhere. Passage of House Bill 1015, Amendment 1106H would provide continuity and consistency in the execution of teaching reading to all children in our public schools in an explicit and systematic approach. The National Reading Panel considered over 10,000 studies of how children learn to read over a period of many years since 1966. Several were selected for review and analysis. The National Reading Panel research findings are five essential elements of reading. Phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. The five components of reading are inclusive of the various English language arts areas and must be implemented in a response to intervention model that includes screening, benchmarking, and progress monitoring. When the National Reading Panel find findings were disseminated to New Hampshire school districts, many engaged in implementation strategies, updated programs, added instruction and interventions in the five essential components. This dates back to 2005. Sustainability of best practices requires leadership from the top, and it must remain priority. The National Reading Panel's analysis made it clear what the best approach to reading instruction should be. Last session, RSA 200-59 was passed, updating the requirements for universal evidence-based reading screening for all students for indicators of dyslexia and other related disorders. But we've put the cart before the horse. This body needs to provide clear policy on the what. We want for all New Hampshire students to be proficient in literacy skills. Approve this bill and this amendment to give all public schools the legislative leadership that should have already occurred. Once passage, the message to all school districts will be consistent and clear. This amendment is not a list of unfunded mandates or a list of directives. It's in full support of RSA 193E2, which says it is the responsibility of local teachers administrators, and school boards to identify and implement approaches to best suited for the students in their communities and to choose the methods of instruction, the activities, and the materials that they are to use. In addition, no further educator testing is needed because it is already required. New Hampshire certification requires already the candidates must pass a specialized exam and that's since 2014, teachers need to take a foundations of reading test. And that is if they are becoming certified as an early childhood educa educator in elementary education K-6, to in elementary education K-8, to a reading and writing teacher, or a reading and writing specialist. In addition to that reading test, they must all take the Praxis I of test of basic skills and the Praxis too, which is in a content areas. Take the advice and recommendation from professional educators who have walked the walk and talked the talk for what's best for kids. Public school educators know teaching and learning. Let them carry it out. This bill can ensure all New Hampshire students and children are afforded reading development and instruction that is delivered to meet the needs of their individual abilities. This bill leaves local control in the hands of the districts. It sets expectations as to what skills the state of New Hampshire feels every student needs to know in order to be afforded the best chances for success. Ultimately, this legislative body should prioritize equitable literacy instruction by setting policy as identified in Amendment 1106H for the benefit and enhancement of all New Hampshire public school students. On behalf of what's best for kids, I urge you to vote yes on OTPA 1106H. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Does the member yield to questions? Yes. Member yields. I guess I, I guess no is the answer. <laughs> uh, division has been requested. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is the Amendment 1106H. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Ball for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that explicit systematic phonics-based instruction was the gold, has been the gold standard for teaching reading since 1935 when Orton Gillingham, the grandfather of all phonics-based reading programs, introduced this method for teaching students with dyslexia. And if I know this method of teaching, the five components of reading, has been used in New Hampshire special education classrooms well before I was trained to be a special educator 25 years ago, and if I further know that this gold standard of explicit systematic instruction in reading, writing, and math could easily be implemented in the general education classroom to meet the needs of all students. And if I further know that the New Hampshire Department of Education wisely offered a professional development program in phonics-based instruction called Letters well before the schools uh, were shut down for COVID, and thousands of teachers and parents have participated in that program. And most importantly, Mr. Speaker, if I know that school districts around our state have already begun screening students for reading disabilities, and as we speak, many school districts are piloting phonics-based reading programs that utilize systematic, explicit systematic instruction, then I would press the green button and ensure all New Hampshire students, all New Hampshire schools, make the move to explicit systematic instruction in reading, writing, and math. Thank you. The motion before us is the vote on Amendment 1106H. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Representative Bose. All members present have an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 297 voting yay, 77 voting nay. The amendment passes. It's bills on second reading open to further amendment. Senator Cordelli offers floor amendment 1314. It's in your seat pockets. Chair recognized Rep. Cascadden.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, I urge you to vote ITL on Amendment 1314H for what's not in the best interest of kids. A1314H is contrary to RSA 193E2A, Part 5, lowercase a. It is the responsibility of local teachers, administrators, and school boards to identify and implement approaches best suited for the students in their communities to acquire the skills and knowledge included in the curriculum to determine the scope, organization, and sequence of course offerings, and to choose the methods of instruction, the activities, and the materials to be used. In addition, no further educator testing is needed because it is already required. In short, this amendment would mandate another legislative prescription, increase school costs for personnel to provide services, increase teacher responsibilities for preparing and documenting new individual reading plans, and replace the screening and intervention for dyslexia and related disorders legislation that just went into effect this past September. I urge you to vote ITL on Amendment 1314H in order to make a statewide, a statewide statement for what's best for kids. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Do you recognize Representative Cordelli? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 52, please remember that number. I am offering this floor amendment as I believe we need a comprehensive approach to improving literacy in this state. We cannot wait three years and not pay attention to all pro aspects of the literacy problem in this state. This amendment is the result of two years' work with national and state leaders. It has the support of the New Hampshire Literacy Leaders Group, consisting of reading specialists, district liter literacy directors, and dyslexia interventionists. It all starts with how we teach reading. Research has been done for decades on the way students learn to read and how their brains actually work. This body of research and evidence-based research has been termed the science of reading. We must move away from the old discredited methods in use in many school districts in New Hampshire. So what does this amendment do? First, the Department of Education will evaluate and contract for a universal reading screener to be used by all districts, that contract has to be in place by next January. They will also provide training on the use of that screener. The screener will do various things, including check for deficiencies in the student's reading, recommend interventions for that student, relieve teachers of data entry work, and some of these systems also included a parent portal there is no mandate date for use of this screener by the districts. Screening will be required in K through three grades and three times a year. The current standard is just two times a year. That's not sufficient. If proficiencies are found, event of interventions will be required and that these screeners will automatically recommend strategies. The Department of Education uh, in September is to provide guidance to local school districts on evidence-based research instructional methods that they should be using. And then it will be the local district that picks the curriculum to use. Local control, right? Parental involvement has too often been ignored. That is required in this uh, amendment. Parents have to be notified on a regular basis how their child is uh, making progress and how they can help their child. These are mandates primarily on the department. Periodic workshops for teachers and parents, annual progress reports, but school districts have accountability reports also. And what good is, is this in a comprehensive approach if new teachers are not trained properly coming out of colleges. A survey of, co of college teacher prep programs in New Hampshire found that three of four New Hampshire programs scored a D or an F, including UNH. 
The Department of Education is to annually survey these programs to make sure that they are moving toward the evidence-based instruction methods. Current teachers involved in reading instructions seek certification renewals and will be required to pass a test to show their understanding of the evidence-based methods beginning in 2028. This is the same test that's being given to new teachers asking for their certification. Competitive grants will be available to school districts who have a proficiency rate below the state average. You remember that I asked the number uh, to remember was 52. 52 is the average state proficiency rating in our schools today. 52%, 48% are not proficient. We cannot wait. We can't continue to hear, hear about mental health in the schools. Maybe is mental health problems are due to anxiety because students can't properly read and are having difficulty keeping up with their work. This cannot continue. We need a comprehensive approach that this amendment offers. We have to turn things around now. We can't just tell districts to move to the new methods in three years. We cannot tell the kids to do the best you can. Waiting means failure. Please vote green on this amendment to provide assistance to teachers and students to improve literacy in New Hampshire. And Mr. Speaker, I request a division vote. So Cadelli requests a division. This will be a division vote. Members, take your seats. It's this is a division. The motion before us is floor amendment one three one four. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Ball for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this amendment repeals the dyslexia screening law that we just voted on last session and went into effect in September 2023, and if I know that this amendment narrowly focuses on the 48% of students who score below proficiency in reading, but does nothing to address the needs of the 58% of students who scored below proficiency in math, or the 62% of students who scored below proficiency in science. And if I know that children's brains develop at different rates, and it is our curriculum that changes at third grade and not our students' brains, indicating the importance of explicit systematic uh, instruction continuing through grade five, something that is not done in this amendment. And if I further know that this amendment places additional unnecessary requirements on educators renewing their license in a time when districts are struggling to retain experienced educators and recruit new educators to fill job openings. And if I further know that this amendment provides no time for districts to pilot new programs or budget funds, and also undermines local control by being too prescriptive, too prescriptive in its overreaching, burdensome approach to creating a comprehensive reading plan with little input from the local educators. And Mr. Speaker, if I know I have no idea how much this amendment will cost the taxpayers, it could be three million, it could be five million, or potentially it could be $10 million added to our budget. 
at a time when taxpayers are already having difficulty paying their property taxes. Re and Representative, other this is a PI, not a speech. Okay. Other household expenses. Then I would press the red button and support a more sensible amendment that we just passed to address New Hampshire's low proficiency scores in reading, writing, and math. Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Ladd for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, and good morning, Mr. Speaker. If I know it is unacceptable that 48% of our students in this state are not proficient in reading, if I know this amendment better supports an evidence-based comprehensive approach to teaching reading that includes phonics, phonemic awareness, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, and contains a strong assessment component and required teacher training. And if I know, research indicates that on average, children who are taught phonics get off to a better start in learning to read than children who are not taught phonics. Would I then press the green button to improve proficiency in the state and to approve this amendment? Thank you. The motion before us is Floor Amendment 1314. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, House will attend the state of the vote. 145 voting nay, 229 voting nay, the amendment fails. The motion before us is how to pass as amended on House Bill 1015. This is a division vote. Members should be still in your seats. The motion before us is how to pass as amended. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Cordelli for a parliamentary inquiry. Chair recognizes Representative Ladd. If I know that proficiency in reading is drastically needed and that this program will help do that, would I then press the green button? The motion before us is ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1015. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present have an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 365 voting nay, 9 voting nay. And the report is adopted.
Before we get into the next bill, I'd just like to remind members that parliamentary inquiries are just that. They're not speeches. They need to be concise and to the point. Thank you. Yes, the clerk has an example. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the sky appears blue because blue light is scattered more than the other colors because it takes a shorter, smaller wave to travel, and if I know this, is phenom this phenomenon is called Rayleigh scattering, would I now vote yes by pressing the green button? That's what a PI should be. The Committee on Education to which was referred House Bill 1084 relative to qualifications for the Commissioner of Education. This comes without recommendation. House will be in order. For what reason does the member rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to table HB 1084 and I request a roll call vote. Representative Sweeney has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote on the tabling motion. The motion before us is table House Bill 1084. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Sweeney for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know the sky is a little gray today, and further, Mr. Speaker, if I know that the underlying bill is a targeted piece of legislation towards a commissioner of education in the state, would I now press the green button so that we can lay it on the table? Thank you. Chair recognize Representative Selig for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that there is an amendment that has a carve out for the current Commissioner of Education, and if I know that the underlying bill is about having the best services for our students across the state, would I now vote no on the tabling motion? The motion before us is to table House Bill 1084. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 196 voting nay, 179 voting nay. House Bill 1084 is laid on the table. Committee on Education to which was referred House Bill 1087, establishing a commission to study information literacy and media literacy instruction in public schools. This comes to us without recommendation. Chair recognizes Representative Myler for uh, what Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to move to table this motion. Representative Myler moves to table House Bill 1087. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and 1087 is laid on the table. For what reason, for what reason does the member rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to remove HB 1683 from the table and ask for a roll call vote.
Repres Representative Osborne moves that we take 1683 off the table. And he has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. The motion before us to re is to remove 1683 from the table. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Shapiro for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that every health care procedure, medication, or intervention carries a degree of risk and that it is every Granite State stater's right to weigh benefits and risks for themselves. And Mr. Speaker, if I know that eliminating Medicaid reimbursement for infant male circumcision will diminish health care choice for New Hampshire families and increase health care disparities for low-income Granite Staters, <clears throat> and Mr. S <clears throat> excuse me, and Mr. Speaker, if I further know that HB 1683 just one week ago in this very same chamber was fully litigated and a motion of OTPA was defeated by 19 votes. Would I then push the red button so that HB 1683 can remain on the table where it will undoubtedly be debated well into the future? Chair, recognize Representative Osborne for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that HB 1683 is a simple bill to discontinue taxpayer funding of elective irreversible genital surgeries on babies, would I now press the green button? The motion before us is to remove from the table 1683. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. While members present have an opportunity to vote, House will attend the state of the vote. 189 voting yay, 188 voting nay, and I did vote. HB 1683 is removed from the table. The pending motion before us right now is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Osborne has asked for a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote on the inexpedient to legislate motion.
Okay. Speed. Okay. Clear. The motion before us is inexpedient to legislate. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Osborne for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know HB 1683 is a simple bill to discontinue taxpayer funding of elective irreversible genital surgeries on babies, would I now press the green button? Red button. Chair recognizes Representative Shapiro for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that decisions about infant male circumcision are best left to patients and medical providers, and Mr. Speaker, if I know that complications do occur and there's clearly a need for timely and thorough education for new parents, but Mr. Speaker, if I also know that the overwhelming majority of adult males circumcised at birth have lived completely normal lives, free of physical mutilation, psychological trauma, and circumcision-related sexual problems. Would I then push the green button to support an L ITL motion? The motion before us is inexpedient to legislate in House Bill 1683. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, I also attend the state of the vote. 185 voting nay, 188 voting nay. The ITO motion fails. Representative Tim Cahill is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Having voted on the prevailing side, I move reconsideration of OTPA on House Bill 1683. Representative Cahill moves reconsideration on House Bill 1683 on the ought to pass as amended motion. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say. Do you have a parliamentary? I'm sorry, I I may have lost track, but did we just vote on the ITL? Okay, we're reconsidering it. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, I just sort of lost my place in the system there. Thank you. Okay, the motion before us is reconsideration on ought to pass as amended. A division has been requested. Who requested that? Who would? Representative McKellar requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote.
Okay, the motion before us is to reconsider the order pass as amended motion on House Bill 1683. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Osborne for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I still know that HB 1683 is a simple bill to discontinue taxpayer funding of elective, irreversible genital surgeries on babies, would I now press the green button and maybe the next one can be a voice vote. Chair, recognize Representative Sapiro for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that this bill is not about your personal feelings about male circumcision, and Mr. Speaker, if I know that this bill will decrease choice for New Hampshire residents and increase health care disparities, would I then vote no on reconsideration? Thank you. The motion before us is reconsideration on House Bill 1683, and the motion was ought to pass as amended. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 188 voting nay, 186 voting nay. Reconsideration passes. We're now, back to ought to pass. now we're back to ought to pass as amended. Are you ready for the question? The vision has been requested. Members, take your seats. Well, I don't know who called it, but it is sufficiently seconded. The motion before us is ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1683. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 184 voting nay, 191 voting nay. The motion fails. For what reason does a member rise?
House will be in order. Mr. Speaker, recognizing that although it is not Groundhog Day, we are yet back in the same place, I would move to place House Bill 1683 on the table. The motion is to place 1683 on the table. Are you ready? Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. No. House Bill 1683 is laid on the table. Committee on Education to which was referred House Bill 1093, prohibited and mandatory. The House will be in order. Prohibiting mandatory mass policies in schools comes to us without recommendation. Representative Nobel moves ought to pass and offers floor amendment 0911H, printed in House Record 12, pages 59. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. No. Close the doors. Close the doors. Nobody in or out. No, hold, hold it. This is a confirmation vote. So it's going to be a division vote for those in the chamber. Okay, members need to be in their seats. This is a division vote on the clarification vote that we, on the voice vote we just had. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red, press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
If all members present had an opportunity to vote, I also attend the state of the vote. 172 voting nay, 163 voting nay. The amendment is adopted. So now we're on to ought to pass as amended. And this is where the debate is. Chair recognizes Representative Damon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, I ask you to pause for a moment, step back from the understandably strong emotions around our shared concerns with pandemic history and the impacts of masking so that together we can consider the best outcome for HB 1095. Please imagine that you are an eight-year-old second grade student, we'll call her Lydia. You've had surgery to remove a brain tumor and are now undergoing chemotherapy for months to come. As many of us know, Chemo saves lives, but also often has profound side effects. Most commonly, it greatly reduces immunity, which gets our little girl very vulnerable to any contagious illness. Lydia, who has always thrived in school, has not been able to attend for over a month. Now, her oncologist has authorized her return to school with the qualification that she and her classmates routinely wear masks to protect her from what could be a fatal illness. She is elated. Yet, under HB 1093, Lydia would not be able to return the, the to school. The member will suspend for a minute. There seems to be a mass exodus leaving the chamber for a minute. So would everybody please respect the speaker's right to be heard? If you have to have a conversation, take it out into the ante room. If you're leaving, be quiet, please. Thank you. Member may continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Under HB 1093, Lydia would not be able to return to school because the school district could not require her fellow students to mask for her safety. I ask you, is that fair and reasonable? As a healthcare professional, I know that science is constantly evolving. We make decisions with what we know and understand at a given point in time. The changes in recommendations can be frustrating and confusing. That doesn't mean we shouldn't adjust recommendations. For example, a simple and not particularly emotion-laden topic. Do eggs raise cholesterol or could we freely eat them every day? Over the course of my career as a dietitian, the answer to that question changed more than once. When we finally determined that despite being high in cholesterol, eggs do not significantly increase human cholesterol levels, it was great to share that good news with patients. During COVID, the virus itself changed. The rates of infection in communities fluctuated, and experts adjusted guidance as new knowledge became available. That is the uncomfortable but wonderful reality of science, as we keep learning our approaches to wellness evolve. The COVID pandemic changed us. Our public health knowledge is vastly different than four years ago. The recommendations that led to masking in schools throughout the pandemic were from the best of intentions based on the knowledge of that time. HB 1093 seeks to prohibit public school districts from adopting, enforcing, or implementing policies requiring students or the public to wear a mask while on school property. Since none of us has a reliable crystal ball, we cannot predict our future challenges. We simply cannot know whether it would be valuable to require masking someday. We cannot know when Lydia and students like her will need our reasonable decision making to participate in the education that all students deserve. This outright ban is a step too far. We need to have flexibility for different circumstances. We need to continue to allow our local elected school boards the freedom to respond to health emergencies according to the needs of their local community. We all hope to put the pandemic behind us and never need to mask again. Yet we should maintain flexibility for addressing our unknown future. Please join me in pressing the red button to maintain local control over these decisions. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Noble. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a public school parent during COVID, 
I remember all too well what it was like for our kids. It was a time we would like to leave in the past, but not before taking preventative measures for the future. School mask mandates had a negative impact on our children and did not promote an environment that is conducive to learning. In a Harvard poll conducted in March of 22, 46% of parents said mask wearing hurt their child's social learning and interactions. 39% said it affected their child's mental and emotional health. This is consistent with testimony that we received in person and online. A heavy burden was placed on children to protect adults. They were treated as if they and those around them were perpetually sick, creating a climate of fear. Students were repeatedly told that they would get their family members sick if they didn't keep their masks up. They had to wear a mask for hours a day, in school, on the bus, during gym class, at recess outdoors, and even while playing instruments. Students with autism, anxiety, asthma, or learning disabilities were not able to get exemptions from these mandates. However, under the governor's mask mandate, they would have been exempted. His mask mandate exempted K through 12 students, teachers, and staff. School mask mandates originated with school boards. Finally, in February of 22, the governor said that schools would no longer be able to mandate masks, and those that continued their mandates would be in violation of Ed 306 rules. Some had already dropped their mandates by then, but many had not. Teachers and administrators also grew weary of the mask mandates. In an article at that time, a local superintendent said, as administrators and teachers were tired of asking kids to continue pulling up their masks and explain to them why. It's just kind of a mass fatigue, if you will, on the part of the wearers and the people that have to enforce the wearing. The opposition to this bill is concerning because it means there is a potential for this to happen again. If there's some public health crisis in the future, then mandates will need to come from the state because school boards are not qualified to make these types of decisions. This bill does not ban masks. It simply leaves it up to the most local decision makers, the families and their students. Please vote yes. Thank you, and Mr. Speaker, I request a roll call vote. Representative Noble has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. Members need to be in their seats.
The motion before us is ought to pass on House Bill 1093. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Belboni for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that local school districts are responsible for developing policies and procedures to ensure the safety and protection of their students and staff members, especially those most vulnerable to potential harm from infection. And if I know it is impossible to predict what health emergencies might arise in the future and what the recommended best practices for prevention of infection will be, and this bill may prohibit school districts from following state mandates. Then would I now press the red button to keep students in classrooms and allow elected school boards the freedom to respond to health emergencies according to the individual needs of their communities. Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Coratello for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that some reasonable doubt exists regarding the overall effectiveness of wearing face masks, as expressed in numerous medical journal articles and by a growing number of medical experts, if I know that face masks have been proven by widespread anecdotal evidence to have harmed children emotionally and physically and to have hindered their education during the COVID pandemic, if I believe that local school board members are not medical experts and should not be arbitrarily mandating the wearing of face masks, would I now protect school boards from being held liable for the harm caused by face masks and press the green button? The motion before us is out of pass in House Bill 1093. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. Household ten. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? Household tend to stay to the vote. 187 voting nay, 184 voting nay. Committee reports. Committee on Education to which was referred House Bill 1287FN relative to the definition of the term evidence-based within public education comes without recommendation. Representative Belcher moves ought to pass. Chair recognizes Representative Cascaden for a, uh, to speak against the report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Albert Einstein stated, the essence of science is the seeking in whatever manner is suitable. There's no logical path. Where does a hunch end and where does evidence begin? Many kinds of evidence are available to practitioners to support ideas and propositions in their work from observation, documents, word of others, reason, or reflection from research of one kind or another. Evidence may take different forms and be valued differently in different places. Scientists' discourse in reflecting on methodological traditions is that there is generally acceptance of no particular, no correct or proper way of generating or marshalling evidence. 
Evidence based within public education includes subjective and objective data. House Bill 1287 is another overreaching unfunded mandate dictating certified professionals on how to carry out their work. And Charles Dickens states, take nothing on its looks, take everything on evidence. Speaking as an educator and a practitioner, House Bill 1287 cannot guarantee more positive academic outcomes. This bill will not have any effect or impact on lowering budgets, and it's not even a reasonable or common sense bill. It would be impossible to carry out. Please vote no on OTP so that another motion can be um, presented. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Belcher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. So let me explain to you what this bill does with a quick analogy. If we look at the field of healthcare and we want to learn something about whether or not blood pressure medication is working to reduce blood pressure, we would run a scientific study and we would want to look for information like, did it lower blood pressure? How much did it lower blood pressure? And were there side effects? But what if I said we could do this a different way and simply just ask the doctors, do you feel like this is working? Those are two pieces of evidence, but they are not equal in what they are demonstrating to you. There's no reason that we shouldn't be doing what everyone else is doing in, in pharmaceuticals and elsewhere in education by relying on good objective data and the scientific method as far as doing scientific research. We have colleges all over this country doing scientific research on these methods every day. We should be using them. Yet, currently, so much of what is done in education is relying on surveys. They simply send out this and they ask questions about how people think things are going or how they feel things are going. That's not good enough evidence. If we pass this bill, what we will do is we will require them to align it with only objective data. By aligning it with objective data and good science, what we will do is we will improve outcomes while simultaneously reducing costs because over time we're going to stop chasing so many fads and settle on what works. Please support this. Please press the green button. Thank you. Motion before us is ought to pass on 1287. Uh, we will call, Mr. Speaker. Representative Belcher has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. <clears throat> It'll be a roll call vote. The motion before us is not a pass on House Bill 1287. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Luno for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> if I know this bill is modeled on a national bill that started in another state and is the latest effort to inject religion and unscientific views into the science classroom, and if I know no, it will unleash an assault against scientific integrity leaving students confused and unprepared to excel in the modern workforce, and if I know New Hampshire students perform among the best in the country, and Mr. Speaker, if I know the moon is not made of cheese, then would I press the red button to defeat this bill and support strong student outcomes? Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative McDonald for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, if I believe that words should mean what they say they mean, 
And if I know that accurately defining reliable data as evidence based does not prohibit self-reported data from being used, but it simply must be labeled as such, and finally, if I know that teachers, students, and administrators will benefit from this legislation, would I now press the green button to support the motion? Thank you. Motion before us is on to pass on House Bill 1287. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, House will tend to stay to the vote. 179 voting nay, 193 voting nay. The motion fails. Representative Luno moves, Luno moves inexpedient to legislate. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. As opposed nay. No. The ayes have it. 170, 193 to 197. <laughs> Committee on Education to which was referred House Bill 1383 relative to Cooperative School Board District Elections. This comes without recommendation. Representative Codelli moves ought to pass and offers amendment 1123H, printed in House Record 12, page 40, 145, 146. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. No. The division has been called on the amendment. Only people in the room, nobody in, nobody out. Okay, this is a clarification vote on the amendment. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 188 voting nay, 187 voting nay. The amendment is adopted. The chair, and now the motion before us is ought to pass as amended. The chair recognizes Representative Luno. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill is amended is an attempt by the state government to interfere with private contracts. It would make changes to articles of agreement voted on by the members of a cooperative school district. These agreements define how these school districts apportion and elect board members and how budgets are funded. Some people might like the changes that are mandated by this bill, but most won't. This bill makes changes to these contracts against the will of voters. Let's stand up for one of the most fundamental principles, and that's to keep the state out of private contracts. Let's vote against the motion of ought to pass as amended. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Chair recognizes Representative Cordelli. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the little town of Effingham, New Hampshire. It's a little town of about 1,700 people in Carroll County and one of the six towns in the Governor Wentworth School District. Question for you. Who do you, thinks, who do you think elects the Effingham representative to the Cooperative School Board? If you say Effingham, you're wrong. Every voter in the school district elects the representative from Effingham. Do you think that Wolfboro residents, where the high school and middle school are, should, with a population of four times that of Effingham, should control who the Effingham representative is? In a recent election, the Effingham candidate A, let's call him, won the Effingham vote. But candidate B won because of all the other towns voting for candidate B. We hear about fairness all the time. Fairness in funding, for instance. Well, how about fairness in representation? I know that Chairman Ladd would probably not want all the Carroll, excuse me, Grafton County represent, uh, voters voting for his seat in uh, Haverhill. This bill is about fairness. It simply says that Effingham and every other small town in a cooperative school district should elect their own school board representative. Vote for fairness. Vote green. Motion before us is ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1383. A division has been requested. Members, take your seats. The motion, be the motion before us is ought to pass as amended in House Bill 1383. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Tanner for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know cooperative school districts are complex and vary in how they elect their school board members based on an area agreement. And if I know that this bill removes the power of each citizen of cooperative school districts to choose the best election system for this situation by inserting a one-size-fits-all solution. And if I know in a cooperative school districts, voters should be able to decide how they are governed and how they choose their school board, not this legislature, would I now vote in opposition to ought to pass with with amendment by pressing the red button. Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Ladd for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. If I know this bill provides the opportunity for all districts within a cooperative school district to elect their own board member who is domiciled in their district, and if I know residents in small pre-existing districts within a cooperative school district often feel disenfranchised without their voice being heard. Would I then press the green button in support of small town residents and fair elections? Thank you. Motion before us on House Bill 1383 is ought to pass as amended. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
If all members present had an opportunity to vote, the House will attend the state of the vote. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, the House will attend the state of the vote. The ayes 185, nays 188, the motion fails. Representative Luno moves interim study. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and 1383 is interim studied. Committee on Education to which was referred House Bill 1452 FN relative to credentials for the position of superintendent of schools and school business officer. This comes without recommendation. Senator Luno moves ought to pass. For what reason does a member rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to table House Bill 1452. Mr. Sweeney moves to table House Bill 1452. Division has been requested. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1452. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Ladd for a parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Speaker, if I know the tabling motion is the motion, would I vote green? Chair recognizes Representative Woodcock for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, thank you Mr. Speaker. If I know that every superintendent of a school district is the educational leader of the district, and if I know that there is a vast array of evidence-based research that defines a correlation between school leaders and the success, success of that school or system, and if I know that preparation, training, and experience in the field is the most sound approach to effective leadership organization, then when I now press the red button, so that students, taxpayers in New Hampshire would be better served by central office leaders that have credentials and experience in education to lead the school district than by the current fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants approach. Please vote red. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1452. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will tend to say the vote. 193 voting nay, 182 voting nay, 1452 is laid on the table.
Committee on Education to which was referred House Bill 1453 relative to degree granting authority of certain institutions of higher education comes without recommendation. Senator Luno moves ought to pass. For what reason does a member rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to table HB 1453. Senator Sweeney moves to table House Bill 1453. Division. A division has been requested. Members should still be in your seats. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1453. It's a division vote. Chair recognized Representative Ladd for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. If I know the state of New Hampshire welcomes both nonprofit and for-profit for institutions for higher education in the state, would I then vote green? Chair recognized Representative Woodcock for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. If I know that nonprofit organizations' singular mission is to fulfill the needs of the client or the guest or the student, while for profit organizations' singular mission is to make profit, and if I know that every private college and university in New Hampshire currently is nonprofit and meets all federal anti discrimination regulations, while for profit colleges have less obligation to meet those same anti discrimination and Title IX regulations, then when I press the red button and continue to support colleges whose primary goal is education of the student and not profit. Motion before us is the table, House Bill 1453. They say division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay the vote. 190 voting yay, 184 voting nay. House Bill 1453 is laid on the table. <laughs> Committee on Education to which was referred House Bill 1476 FN relative to Scotter School Charter School Memorandums of Understanding. This comes without recommendation. Senator Luno moves ought to pass. For what reason does the member rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to table HB 1476. Senator Sweeney moves to table House Bill 1476. Division. A division has been requested. Members, take your seats.
The motion before us is to table 14, House Bill 1476. This is a division vote. Chair recognized Representative Ladd for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know a charter public school and a resident district are required to have an MOU in place to ensure that students are provided services in accordance with IEP plans at the start of the school year, and if I know that this bill proposes to delay the MOU that defines how special education services are provided to the charter public school until November 1, two months after the start of school, and delaying that IEP. Would I then do the best thing with the bill, and that's to table it. Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Belboni for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that school districts are obligated to provide special education and 504 services to identified students who reside in their districts but attend charter schools, regardless of whether or not a memorandum of understanding is in place between the district and the charter schools, and if I know that extending the due date for the memorandum of understanding would be beneficial to both the school district and the charter school without resulting in any delay of services to the students, then would I now press the red button to defeat the table. Thank you. Motion before us is to table House Bill 1476. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had the opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay the vote. 192 voting nay, 182 voting nay. House Bill 1476 laid on the table. The Committee on Education, which was referred to House Bill 1481, relative to appointments to fill vacancies to at-large cooperative school board seats, comes to us without recommendation. Representative Dry moves ought to pass. Representative Tanner is recognized to speak against the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're back to cooperative school districts. Um, cooperative school districts are formed by joining towns to share the significant effort and cost of providing schools, educational programs, transportation, and other educational requirements. There are about 31 cooperative school districts in New Hampshire, operating in New Hampshire. Cooperative schools vary widely across the state in size and how they operate. Usually, the cooperative school district maintains elementary schools in separate towns and then consolidates students for middle and high school. Each district has unique and complex articles of agreement or informal agreements that outline shared cost, governance, and operation. The cooperative's articles of agreement set the procedures for electing school board members and replacing vacancies, which vary from cooperative to cooperative. Some districts elect their school board members at large, others a com combination of at-large and from specific towns. 
and or elections strictly within each town. HB 1481 requires a one-size-fits-all procedure for all cooperative school districts for filling vacant seats in the school board. The bill stipulates that when a school board seat is vacated, the successor must be appointed from the same municipality as the outgoing member was at the time of their election. The amended bill will apply retroactively to existing articles of agreement without voter approval. Finding any qualified volunteer to fill school board seats, as we know, is often difficult and time consuming. 1481 makes it harder to fill a vacant seat by taking a local cooperative school's procedure that has been working in place for this situation and makes it more restrictive and complex. This can result in a vacant seat that could remain empty for a considerable time. Long-term vacancies on school boards could affect the unique circumstances each cooperative school board may face when governing their district. The many issues involved with cooperative school districts should not be addressed, as we've seen, with piecemeal and highly one-fits-all restrictive solutions, but instead should be addressed with a study committee to review and recommend comprehensive legislation that takes into consideration the various and unique situations of cooperative schools and the Articles of Agreement. Please vote red on 1481. Thank you. Representative Dries recognized to speak in support of the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. As you just heard, the number and the composition, the method of selection, the terms of the members of uh, cooperative school boards are all provided by the bylaws and the area agreements, or the articles of agreements that cooperative districts have. They vary from district to district. But just because towns are in a cooperative doesn't mean that they're the same size. So when a vacancy occurs in any cooperative board seat that's elected at large, it's important to maintain any balance of town or municipality representation that might exist on the board. The easiest way to do this is to have the vacancy filled by a successor who is from the same municipality as the outgoing member. This bill establishes that requirement, and I urge its passage. And Mr. Speaker, I ask for a division vote. The question is on the motion of ought to pass on House Bill 1481. This is a division vote. Members, take your seats. Questions on the motion about to pass in House Bill 1481. This is a division vote. Representative Cornell is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that each cooperative school district is unique, and if I know that cooperative school districts each have existing articles of agreement, and if I believe that this bill would interfere with existing contracts without voter approval, which I believe they would object to, would I now press the red button so a different recommendation may be made? Representative Nobles recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know the least restrictive means to maintain 
the elected balance on a cooperative school board is to replace a vacancy with a person from the same town, would I then press the green button? The questions on the motion of ought to pass in House Bill 1481. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. If you're opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 186 in the affirmative, 188 in the negative. The motion fails. Representative, Representative Tanner moves. Luno. In, I'm sorry. Luno, Luno moves interim study. All right, then. The motion's interim study on House Bill 1481. You ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the motion's adopted. The Committee on Education, which was referred to House Bill 1592, FN Local, relative to the use of education freedom account funds in religious schools, comes to us without recommendation. Representative Myler moves out to pass. Representative Cordelli is recognized to speak against the motion. For what reason does a member rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to table House Bill 1592 and ask for a roll call vote. Representative Sweeney moves that House Bill 1492 be laid on the table. This is a roll call. Uh, he requests a roll call, and it is well seconded. Members, take your seats. The motion is to table House Bill 1592. Representative Damon's recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Oh, never mind. Didn't see you there. Representative Ladd's recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. If I know this bill would prohibit the use of e-education freedom account funds from being used for tuition to religious schools, and if I know a high court, the high court held that when governments choose to subsidize private schools, they must allow such funds to pay for religious schools. And if I know the majority of justices believe that excluding religious groups from government programs is a violation of the First Amendment free exercise clause, well, then I then support the motion of tabling this bill by pressing the green button. Thank you. Now, Representative Damon is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that separation of church and state is essential to the freedom to safely practice the religion of our choice, and if I know that the New Hampshire Constitution prohibits public taxpayer dollars from being used to support religious schools and religious education, and has prohibited it for 240 years, 
Would I now press the red button to vote against the table motion? Thank you. The motion is to lay House Bill 1592 on the table. It's a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 191 in the affirmative, 186 in the negative. House Bill 1592 is laid on the table. The Committee on Education who has referred House Bill 1616 relative to parental consent for student participation in Medicaid to schools programs comes to us without recommendation. Representative Cordelli moves ought to pass and offers amendment 0716H printed in House Record 12 on page 165. The questions on adoption of the amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the, mo and the amendments adopted. Now we're on to the motion of ought to pass with amendment. Representative Balboni is recognized to speak against the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. HB 1616 concerns the Medicaid, the New Hampshire Medicaid to School Program which allows school districts the opportunity to be partially reimbursed by the federal Medicaid program for eligible services to students. This program helps local school districts reduce the cost of special education services to local taxpayers. Parental consent is required for a student to participate in the program and must be obtained prior to the billing of Medicaid. This parental consent is typically obtained during the IEP or 504 process during which a parent agrees to all IEP or 504 services as a whole. Only services that are considered medically necessary for the student to benefit from their educational program are eligible for reimbursement, such as some occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, and psychological services. HB 1616 adds another step to the process that is currently not required. The parent will need to provide an additional consent for Medicaid billing for a new service, even though they have already agreed to that service change in the IEP review process. This increases the cost of administrative services and potentially increases the cost to your local school district if this permission is not received and Medicaid cannot reimburse the school. The Department of Health and Human Services has indicated that New Hampshire will be transitioning to a new claiming methodology to better reflect direct and indirect health costs, healthcare costs in schools. Interim study would allow the committee to look at Medicaid to schools and other Medicaid programs as a whole to better understand all the issues that could be addressed by the department or through future legislation. I urge you to vote no on the motion of OTPA so that a new motion can be made. And Mr. Speaker, I ask for a division vote. Representative Cordell is recognized to speak in support of the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I agree with uh, a lot of what the previous uh, speaker said. Uh, Medicaid uh, to schools uh, program provides millions of dollars of funding to school districts. 
and parental consent is required for the first billing for services. We think in this majority opinion that for every new service that is being billed, the parent should have written consent for that as well. This is parents' rights. The parents should know what's going on and what services are being provided to their children and have the right to consent before that new service is being billed and schools are getting money for that service. Please vote for parents and parents' rights by pressing the green button. The questions on the motion about to pass with amendment on House Bill 1616. This, a division was requested. This will be a division vote. Members, take your seats. Questions on the motion of ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1616, and this is a division vote. Representative Hall is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Speaker, if I know that this bill would require parents to provide an additional consent for Medicaid billing for a new service, even though they had already agreed to that service change during the IEP review process, and if I know that this bill would result in unnecessary paperwork and related costs to administrative services and possibly to local districts as well. And finally, if I know that a vote to interim study this bill would allow DHHS to look at this program as well as other Medicaid programs as a whole to better understand concerns that need to be addressed, would I now press the red button so that another motion could be made? Thank you. Representative Laz recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. If I know by removing parental consent when schools bill for Medicaid reimbursement, the parent is no longer able to attest to service provided, question billed services, or require correction if the billing is not accurate, and if I believe parental consent and approval is necessary and adds on an additional layer of protections for both taxpayers and the child, would I then support the need for parental review and parental consent when schools bill for Medicaid reimbursement by pressing the green button? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is on the motion of ought to pass on House Bill 1616. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will attend to the state of the vote. 190 in the affirmative, 187 in the negative, the motion is adopted. For what reason does a member rise? I move to take HB 1353 off the table.
Representative, Representative Kuchab moves that House Bill 1353 be removed from the table, and this will be a division vote. Members, take your seats. The question is whether to remove House Bill 1353 from the table, and this is a division vote. Representative Lynn is recognized for a parliamentary, parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that it makes no sense at all to give any agency which has the authority to impose disciplinary action, particularly an agency as important as the Department of Education, to not have the authority to compel cooperation and to get, be able to get records and people to, to cooperate with their investigation, then would I press the green button to take this uh, uh, bill from the table so that we can have a debate on the merits of the bill? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I ask for a division vote. Yeah, we're there. <laughs> Representative Marjorie Smith is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the Judiciary Committee has struggled with this bill over two sessions, and if I know that um, somewhere between 10 and 18 members of the Judiciary Committee um, has not seen the amendment that is going to be proposed, and if I know that this complete rewrite has not been vetted um, and it is too broad, lacks sufficient due process, and is prone to fishing, would I now vote no on the motion to remove this bill from the table? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is whether to remove House Bill 1353 from the table, and this is a division vote. If you are in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Well, members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will attend to the state of the vote. 183 in the affirmative, 194 in the negative, the motion fails. The Committee on Education, to which was referred to House Bill 1642, relative to the role of cooperative school district board member representatives on school district budget committees, comes to us without recommendation. Representative Pedernell moves out to pass, and Representative Tanner is recognized to speak against the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Cooperative school districts, again. HB 1642 removes the voting power of the cooperative school board member on the local budget committee and makes it an ex officio non-voting position. Member will suspend for a minute. Sorry, I didn't mean to make a jump. It uh, got wicked noisy in here, so if you're going somewhere, please go quietly so the member can be heard. Please proceed. Thank you. 
Uh, this bill changes current law, which requires the Budget Committee to include one member from the Cooperative School Board as a voting member. The School Board member acts as a liaison to the Budget Committee, providing context and helping the Committee on the elements of the budget presented by the School District. The Board member improves cooperation and communication between School Districts and the Budget Committee by being knowledgeable about the operational and instructional needs of the school. As a full voting member of the committee, the board's member's input has much greater impact than that of an, as merely an observer. The issue of cooperative school districts, including this bill and all the other ones that we've had, um, should be worked on with representatives from all stakeholders, including the cooperative school districts and municipalities, in an interim study to better understand their needs and to consider future legislation. Remember that the cooperative school districts formed together with articles of agreement. Um, and I urge you to vote red on this so that a motion for interim study can be brought forward. Thank you. Representative Petternell is recognized to speak in support of the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Bill 1642 removes the double voting power from the appointed cooperative school district board member on the cooperative school district budget committee. Current law gives this appointed member a vote on both the school board and the budget committee. If we cannot vote twice in an election, why would we give an elected executive twice the voting power? Please vote ought to pass to restore the balance of power on your school board. The questions on the motion of ought to pass on House Bill 1642. Ready for the question? Yeah, I thought so. This will be a division vote. Members, take your seats. Quick note, we only got a couple more before we can go to lunch, but the longer it takes people to go out and then come back in, then lunch gets put off longer. The questions on the motion of ought to pass on House Bill 1642. Representative Damon's recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the extensive knowledge of a cooperative school board member is valuable to the Budget Committee, and if I know that the concerns addressed in this bill should be included in a broader interim study on the governance of cooperative school districts, as noted in previous bill discussions, would I now press the red button so another better motion can be made? Thank you. Representative Cordelli is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I believe that you will not let me vote twice on this bill, but please correct me if I'm wrong, but if I know that co-op school board members who are also on the school district budget committee get two votes on the budget, would I now vote ought to pass so that they become non-voting budget members and thus get one vote like you and me by pressing the green button? Questions on the motion of ought to pass in House Bill 1642, and this is a division vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
all members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will attend to the state of the vote. 185 in the affirmative, 189 in the negative. The motion fails. Representative Luno moves interim study. Moves interim study. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. The ayes have it, and the motion's adopted. The Committee on Election Law to which was referred House Bill 1091, an act relative to the financing of political campaigns. Having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. <coughs> Excuse me. Representative Connie Lane for the committee. The amendment is 1215H, printed in House Record 12 on pages 52 to 59. The question's on the adoption of the amendment. You ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment's adopted. The bill is on second reading and open to further amendment. Representative Lane moves floor amendment 1334H, which can be found in your seat pockets. Questions on the adoption of the amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. All right, then. The ayes have it. And the amendment's adopted. Now we're on to the main motion of ought to pass with amendments. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it and the motion's adopted. The Committee on Election Law to which was referred House Bill 1596 FN requiring a disclosure of deceptive artificial intelligence usage in political advertising comes to us without recommendation. Who moves out to pass, Paul? Who moves out to pass? Representative Brennan. Brennan. Representative Brennan moves out to pass. And offers amendment 1209H printed in House Record 12 and pages 164 to 165. The question's on the amendment. You ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it and the amendment's adopted. The bill's on second reading and open to further amendment. Representative Brennan moves floor amendment 1363H, which can be found in your seat pockets. The question's on the adoption of the amendment. You ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it and the amendment's adopted. Now we're on to the main motion of ought to pass as amended. Are you ready for that question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. The ayes have it and the motion's adopted. For what reason does the member rise? Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, having, uh, having voted on the prevailing side of House Bill 1596, I believe we just did, uh, I would ask the, uh, for a motion of reconsideration urge the body to vote no. Representative Berry moves reconsideration of House Bill 1596. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. The nays have it. Reconsideration fails. For what reason does a member rise? Uh, for a motion of reconsideration on House Bill 1091. Which which bill? 1091. <laughs> Is this the two that we just House did? Consideration. Reconsideration. Okay. Okay, and I urge the body to vote against it. Thank you. Did I do something wrong? Representative Lane moves reconsideration of House Bill 1091. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. No. The nays have it. Reconsideration fails.
The majority of the Committee on Environment and Agriculture, to which was referred House Bill 1102-FN, an act relative to the definition of animal cruelty, having considered the same report the same with the following resolution, resolved that it is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Peter Bixby for the majority of the committee. The minority of the committee, having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority, report with the recommendation that the bill be referred for interim study. Representative Sherry Ducey for the minority of the committee. What reason does a member rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to table House Bill 1102. Representative Sweeney moves that House Bill 1102 be laid on the table. Ready for the question? Who asked for it? Representative Reed has requested a roll call, and it is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call. Members, take your seats. Questions whether to lay House Bill 1102 on the table. And this is a roll call vote. Representative Sweeney is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know the sky looks a little less gray than it did earlier, and further, Mr. Speaker, if I know we can all get to our lunch table, table soon if we put this bill on the table now, would I now press the green button? Thank you. Representative Bixby is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that we have gotten an, an extraordinary amount of, of email about this bill on both sides, and if I know that it is appropriate for our constituents to know that we have actually heard the debates on both sides, would I oppose the tabling motion? Thank you. The question is whether to lay House Bill 1102 on the table, and it's a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will attend to the state of the vote. 232 in the affirmative, 140 in the negative, 1102 is laid on the table. The majority of the Committee on Environment and Agriculture, to which was referred House Bill 1145-FN, an act prohibiting the private ownership of landfills, having considered the same report the same with the recommendation that the bill ought to pass. Representative Peter Bixby for the majority of the committee. The minority of the committee, having considered the same being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following resolution, resolved that it is inexpedient to legislate Representative Judy Aaron for the minority of the committee. For what reason does the member rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to table HB 1145. Representative Sweeney moves that House Bill 1145 be laid on the table. Who asked? Representative Weber asked for a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats.
The motion is whether to lay House Bill 1145 on the table. Members should be in their seats. Thanks. <laughs> Representative Sweeney is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know the underlying legislation represents a gross misuse and mismanagement of government by taking over and prohibiting private landfills in the state of New Hampshire, would I now vote green to put it on the table where this bill surely belongs? Representative Vermont is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I knew if this was such a gross overreach, then my friends would actually want to debate it and demonstrate that point rather than simply dismissing it without having to make an argument. And Mr. Speaker, if I know that this legislation, the underlying bill, it was the unanimous recommendation of a bipartisan, bicameral study committee, and Mr. Speaker, I, if I know that this is a bill that enjoyed bipartisan sponsorship in our committee and that we have bipartisan speakers lined up to speak in favor of this bill. And if I know, Mr. Speaker, that all of our constituents, whether we live in Keene or we live in Dalton or we live in Rochester or Bethlehem or anywhere else in our state, is tired of being the place where New England dumps its trash, would I vote red so that we can actually talk about the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is whether to lay House Bill 1145 on the table, and it's a roll call vote. If you're in favor of tabling, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 180 in the affirmative, 193 in the negative, tabling fails. All right. The bill is on second reading and open to further amendment. Representative Romano moves floor amendment 1329H, which can be found in your seat pockets. Representative Simon is recognized to speak in favor of the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, colleagues, I don't want to take up a tremendous amount of time uh, right before lunch on this, so I'll keep it really simple. Uh, there are speakers behind me that will speak to the merits of the bill itself. Um, but from the previous vote that you just saw, the likelihood of this bill making it through this chamber is fairly decent. Um, so I would submit to you um, this floor amendment, which basically just says that um, the state and the landfill owner um, have to come to an agreement. There needs to be some conversation on that and some agreement on what happens uh, if the landfill leaks uh, due to ne negligence or mistakes. Uh, it is a reasonable addition to the bill. I think it's a protection for the state uh, taxpayers. Um, so I hope that you will um, vote with me on, on that regardless of how you feel on the underlying bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The questions on the adoption of the amendment. A division vote has been requested. Members, take your seats.
Some questions on the adoption of Amendment 1329H. Representative Aaron is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that this amendment was not discussed with me or my committee, and if I know that this was not part of any discussion as part of our committee hearings, would I press red to vote against this amendment? Thank you. Representative Vermont is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, if I know that this last-minute amendment was part of how we put together a strong bipartisan piece of uh, legislation to bring to you all, would I now press the green button so that we can attach this amendment and move on to the bill? Thank you. The question is on the adoption of Amendment 1329H. This is a division vote. And if you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 234 in the affirmative, 125 in the negative. The amendments adopted. Now we're on to the main motion of ought to pass with amendment. Representative Aaron is recognized to speak against the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker and colleagues, the premise of this bill is to ban private ownership of landfills in New Hampshire in order to get around the U.S. Commerce Clause and allow us to limit or even eliminate the importation of out-of-state trash. It grandfathers in existing landfills, so there will be no impact at all to what we already do at those facilities anyway. Four of the six landfills in the state are publicly owned. Almost 50% of those landfills, landfilled trash, is from out of state. We only have one new landfill permit currently being considered at the State Department of Environmental Services, and it appears this bill just seeks to shut that down. It's not even clear what would happen to that permitting process if this bill were to pass. In terms of landfill capacity and need, we will likely only need one new landfill for the next 25 to 50 years, especially as we have goals to reduce what we place in landfills. Landfilling also is our last resort in handling solid waste, according to our state solid waste management plan. Nine members of my committee strongly believe that banning private ownership of landfills in New Hampshire in order to control the amount of out-of-state trash being placed into our landfills is wrong. Our state and counties and municipalities already have the ability to establish landfills in our state and have done so successfully in several places. And they currently compete alongside privately owned landfills. These entities can already set up, step up and propose establishing a landfill to fulfill a need. Banning the private ownership of landfills is just not business friendly. 
Even if a private business enters into a contract with the state, county, or municipality to operate a publicly owned landfill, but not own the land, why would a contractor want to invest millions of dollars in infrastructure on a site that they would eventually abandon, or worse, if their contract is not renewed by the public entity, they'd have to leave it behind. They'd have to hand over all that infrastructure to another contractor who would then run this landfill. The contractor could also possibly walk away from a future environmental disaster, leaving the state to hold the bag and clean up the mess. The devil certainly would be in the details of the contract. There are many other questions regarding state, county, and municipal ownership of landfills, such as would the government entity likely take land via eminent domain to establish a landfill? Who would have the liability for the land if the land became contaminated or becomes an environmental problem? Should these costs, along with operational costs, be borne by New Hampshire taxpayers? And what about the increase in costs and tipping fees that are likely to occur? This would surely impact New Hampshire taxpayers, and we don't believe that this is the right solution as it creates many more problems and increases the cost to New Hampshire taxpayers. Considering that we already have a bill that was passed unanimously by our committee that caps out state trash, out of state trash by 15% in accordance with the US Commerce Clause, and we already passed a bill that pauses the permitting and establishment of a new landfill until 2028, plus other new rules and regulations that are being put into place with regard to landfills, this bill really is unnecessary. And I think our time would be better spent by crafting policies to use current technologies to create better, more innovative ways to dispose of trash, both in state and out of state, and doing a more efficient and cost-effective job of recycling, reusing, repurposing, purifying, and even incinerating the trash that we truck into the current landfills of our state. So I please ask you to vote no on OTPA so another motion can be made, and I request a division vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Potenza is recognized to speak for the committee report. So I'm pretty much going to speak to the Republican inconsistencies in regards to HB. Oops. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, sorry. Um, I'm going to speak to the Republican inconsistencies into HB 1145. So a Republican talking point that is we can't stifle private businesses, right? So I would like to remind y'all when we were talking about passing the bill to ban China from owning land in New Hampshire, and I supported that. So let's say a brand new Beijing-based, state-of-the-art solid waste company comes into New Hampshire, buys up all the available property, then they simultaneously put in 10 applications to build massive landfills that have 30-plus year life in New Hampshire. Right now, there is nothing stopping them from doing so because DES only reviews applications and approves based upon rules, not need. Last year, DES told a group of legislators, I was there, and concerned New Hampshire citizens in a meeting, their job is to get the permit applications to a yes. That was concerning for us all to hear. Let me remind this body that even after St. Gobain polluted the drinking water for an entire region in southern New Hampshire, DES approved another permit before the company decided to close up shop. That made us all pretty upset especially the folks that live in Merrimack. So we were told that it was approved because they can't look at unrelated items outside of the application that is staring right in front of them. Our landfill permitting rules are weak, and the new rules in this process that they're undertaking are looking to be some of the weakest in New England and in the country. So, because trash is a multi-billion dollar business, and private companies, because of federal clause, are using New Hampshire as their dumping ground to make, to make sure that they will continue to buy property and build landfills based upon their profit, not needs, of the New Hampshire citizens. 
We all encourage private businesses to build here or come to New Hampshire to improve our economy, our communities, and we want them to be good stewards to our environment. But this is not a typical business. Landfills should not be, ba be built based upon anything else but need. Do we really want New Hampshire to become the trash state? The state is letting private businesses drive the trash bu bus, which is not in the best interest for Granite Staters. If we do things right with reduction, recycling, and new technology to include some amazing, amazing things that they're, they're doing with incineration, we should only need one landfill in the next century. This bill enables a public-private partnership. This, the only thing that the state owns is the land. That's it. This saves the private company time and money. The private company runs everything else. The standard practice, this is actually the standard practice everywhere in the country, besides over 50% of the landfills in the entire country are, are exclusively pro, uh, public. And Maine, just so you know, when we're talking about that landfill that everybody wants to stop that's happening up north, actually has um, a public-private partnership with that same company right across the border that is thriving. It's a 32-year 32 32 year, uh, 32 year contract. These are not private businesses either. Our private operator landfills are from companies that are headquartered outside of New Hampshire. They are in uh, Texas and Vermont. So to wrap this up, this bill enables the state to pick a good site with good soil near the major sources of in-state generation rather than being at the mercy of a company and land over, over, um, owner sorry, <laughs> who don't care about the safety or the truck or their traffic distance. And this bill enables us to put New Hampshire taxpayers in our trash first. HB 1145 also would not require the New Hampshire to reduce the flow of out-of-state trash. It merely allows us to be in the driver's seat for us. So, for example, let's say we have a landfill and it's not getting filled. The state can make those decisions to increase that percentage at any time. So, in fact, um, we could turn on and turn off the flow wholly or partially as we see fit based upon our circumstances. So please join me in passing HB 1145 so that we don't make New Hampshire a sanctuary state of trash from New England, most especially from Massachusetts. It's time to put New Hampshire trash first. The question on the motion of ought to pass is amended on House Bill 1145. A representative Granger requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? That is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. Questions on the motion about to pass as amended in House Bill 1145, and this is a roll call vote. Representative Crichton is recognized for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that HB 1145 commits the state to ownership of private operations, if I also know that under current rules, the state or municipalities already own four of six landfills. And if I also know 
that to provide safe and effective landfills in the future, we should not limit options for establishing ownership. Would I not press the red button so that another more appropriate motion can be made? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Representative Rochefort recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this body has a long history of supporting clean water and responsible environmental measures, and if I know that this proposal establishes a balanced relationship where the private and public entities can work together, and if I know that over 50% of landfills in the United States are already publicly owned, with some operated by the same companies conducting business here in New Hampshire, if I know that at one point, in the not too distant past, nearly all the trash dumped in New Hampshire was dumped in publicly owned landfills, also known as the town dump. And finally, if I know Granite Staters express strong opposition to the notion of our picturesque state being used as a dumping ground for Massachusetts, then do I now hit the green button to keep the trash in mass. The question is on the motion of ought to pass as amended in House Bill 1145. It's a roll call vote. If you are in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 208 in the affirmative, 162 in the negative, the motion is adopted. The House will be in recess until 1.45.
Next to the administration to which was referred House Bill 1059, an act relative to state building code. If it considered the same, report the same with the following amendment and a recommendation bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Carol McGuire for the committee. The amendment is 0804H, printed in House Record 12, page 48. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Bills on second reading open to further amendment. Representative McWilliams offers floor amendment 1300H. The chair recognizes Representative McWilliams. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to address some misinformation that you may have heard about this amendment. The challenges of affordable housing are deeply complex. This amendment is about commercial properties. This is a commercial energy code amendment, and it does not affect most residential units in the state. It will affect zero single family homes or any other residential spaces of three stories or less. This amendment has no bearing on construction of new residential single family homes. Instead, this amendment is to update the New Hampshire Commercial Energy Code only from 2018 to 2021 standards. There is no mandate in the Commercial Energy Code to require net zero buildings as part of this update. Why should we adopt the 2021 Commercial Energy Code? Granite staters like you and me spend 95% of their time in buildings. And the majority of this time is spent in commercial buildings, schools and workplaces. The change between the current energy code and the 2021 commercial energy code includes mechanical duct insulation, a tighter vapor barrier on exterior walls to keep out mold and keep in humidity, and increased air changes. We've studied indoor health in schools and found that in New England, we need to keep the humidity levels between 40 and 60% relative humidity to protect the cilia in our upper respiratory tracts to ward off colds and the flu. The 2021 Commercial Energy Code does this. <clears throat> indoor air quality matters for human health and productivity. There is a compelling business case for healthy buildings. A Harvard COGFX study found that breathing better air is better for cognitive function and making health-related indoor air quality improvements leads to reduced absenteeism, better cognitive function, and better employees. MIT has found through a similar study that healthy buildings command higher rents per square foot and contribute over 20 billion with a B dollars in worker productivity nationwide. The 2021 Commercial Energy Code does this as well. We heard committee testimony that large commercial builders in New Hampshire support updating the Commercial Energy Code to 2021. We need the Commercial Energy Code. Failing to adopt the code will be a cost shift from contractors to building owners. This will increase the cost for building owners that occupy buildings, for taxpayers paying for energy in municipal and school facilities, and for commercial entities that lease space. We need this bill. The 2021 Commercial Energy Code will provide financial benefits to businesses, municipalities, and taxpayers. The United States Department of Energy and the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers have found that the 2021 Commercial Energy Code is cost-effective more than covering the added construction, labor, and materials costs through lower monthly energy costs. <clears throat> For these reasons, I ask that you please support implementing only the Commercial Energy Code 2021 as part of updating all of our other building codes in New Hampshire. Thank you. Chair, recognize your representative Carol McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, first of all, this amendment was seriously considered and rejected by the Building Code Review Board, which consists of a panel of experts, building officials, building inspectors, engineers, and architects. They thought about it and decided it was not appropriate for New Hampshire. The amend floor amendment also strips out the specific 
New Hampshire amendments approved by the Building Code Review Board to the Energy Code, which is, which means that we're getting it straight, unadulterated from uh, California and New York and the other large states. I would like to mention that in New Hampshire, commercial includes apartment buildings as well as businesses and a commercial building is more likely to be built by someone who plans to own it and operate it than a single family home. Those people can choose to go to the more strict energy code, no problem. It's, their, it's well within their authority and they, they can choose to implement it without putting it as a requirement on everybody else. The other point is that it you know, saves, energy, saves energy costs over the life of the building. Well, it might if you can pay for the, for the technology and the testing and the extra materials right away. If, however, you have to take out a 30-year mortgage at 7.5%, seven you're not going to be able to pay for the difference in cost. And that is a choice that the owner of the building should be able to make for him or herself. And that was what the EDNA committee considered when we unanimously voted against adopting the energy code. I hope you will join with us and press the red button on this amendment. Thank you. The motion before us is the McWilliams Floor Amendment. It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote on the amendment, McWilliams Floor Amendment. House, the House will be in order. The motion before us is the McWilliams Floor Amendment 1300H. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Grody for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the Building Construction Review Board didn't outright reject the um, code because, based on its merit, but because it took, would have taken too long to look at the code amendment by amendment, and the, the energy code in 2018 was not adopted in full, but certain amendments were addressed. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if I know that this amendment has no bearing on construction of new residential single family homes or net zero buildings, and if I know and I think we all know that we spend 95% of our time in buildings, and the majority of this time is spent in commercial buildings or house chambers, and that the 2021 Energy Code improves interior air quality and subsequent occupant health and productivity, would I not press the green button? Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Simon for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the majority of the Building Code Review Board rejected um, adopting the energy codes for the 2021 session, and Mr. Speaker, if I know that um, it will definitely increase building costs if we adopt them at this time when we need to be building um, a lot of commercial buildings, and also, Mr. Speaker, that we may not actually save money um, over the life of the, of the building um, because of mortgage rates and interest uh, increasing the cost. Um, would I then press the red button to defeat the floor amendment? Thank you.
The motion before us, the McWilliams Floor Amendment 1300H is the roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present have an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of their vote. 179 voting nay, 192 voting nay. The amendment fails. We're back to auto pass as amended. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Suppose nay. No. The ayes have it. Committee report is adopted. Majority of the Committee on Executive Departments and Administration to which was referred House Bill 1190-FN, an act relative to adopting the Interstate Social Work Licensure Compact. We considered the same, report the same with the following resolution resolved that is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Carol McGuire for the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, we are unable to agree with the majority report with the recommendation that the bill ought to pass. Representative J.C. Grody for the minority of the committee. For what reason does a member rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to table HB 1190. The motion is a proper motion. The motion is to table House Bill 1190. Are you ready for the question? A division has been requested. Members should still be in your seats. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1190. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Grody for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that an interstate social work licensing compact is an important part of our health care program, and if I know that the debate on this um, bill is bipartisan, and I know on the minds of many in this room would I vote against the tabling motion by pressing the red button. Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Simon for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the social compact, interstate social compact, would set up a pseudo-governmental entity with the ability and power to make rules uh, that could go into effect without the approval of the state of New Hampshire that we would then have to retroactively um, address. Um, bringing up serious um, balance of power issues, but I then motion to table this bill. Motion before us is to table House Bill 1190. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
Representative Tim Cahill. Representative Yokella. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, House will attend the state of the vote. 181 voting nay, 192 voting nay, the motion fails. We're back to the majority committee report of inexpedient to legislate. Chair recognizes Representative Shapiro. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm here today to speak against the motion of ITL on House Bill 1190, a bill that will have New Hampshire join an interstate occupational licensure compact for social workers. What is the social work compact? When passed by seven states, this compact will allow licensed social workers to practice across state lines, either through telehealth or in person, a practice alternately referred to as reciprocity or license portability. In other words, if you are receiving men mental health services and move from one compact state to another, you can keep your provider. If you hire a new social worker to join your New Hampshire agency who has a license in good standing in Vermont or perhaps in Massachusetts, no longer will you have to wait months to see if that person can obtain a New Hampshire license. If both states are compact members, the new hire can report to work the very next day. I don't think I have to convince anybody here that we have a mental health workforce problem. The New Hampshire Community Behavioral Health Association, representing the 10 New Hampshire Community Mental Health Centers, reported in January 2024 that there are 325 clinical vacancies across the state. Most clinical positions are master's level practitioners, and most master's level practitioners are social workers. A 2023 performance audit report done by the LBA on mental health workforce licensing indicates that portability of licensure remains a major obstacle to attracting new mental health clinicians. While recent laws have been passed to expedite portability, Processes to do so within OPLC and the relevant boards are just not in place. The mental health workforce shortage is a complicated, multifaceted problem involving inadequate funding, low salaries, high levels of student loans, difficult, stressful work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I am not going to lie to you. If you pass this bill, if we join the social work compact, if a number of licensed social workers come to practice in New Hampshire, free of bureaucratic hurdles, this will not solve the mental health workforce shortage. Here, however, is what it will do. First, it will provide one more useful tool to attract seasoned licensed social workers to either practice independently in the state or take jobs in our many understaffed agencies and therapy practices. Second, it will also have an immediate impact on our military families who move frequently. The Department of Defense, through its military office on military, community, and family policy, is a major player in developing and supporting health care compacts across the country. For these families, it means that members can keep their providers and social work spouses can obtain work without having to apply for a license each time they move. New Hampshire has joined several indispensable health care compacts, including those for physicians, nurses, OTs, PTs, psychologists, mental health counselors, and more. I know that there are those with legitimate concerns about finding ourselves in an ineffective or poorly run interstate organization. If that becomes the case, we can leave. We've done this too. This very body, this very body passed a law to leave an EMT compact in 2020. So please join me in enhancing our response to New Hampshire's well-documented mental health crisis by pushing the red button to defeat the ITL motion so that another motion may be made. And I would ask for a division vote. Chair recognizes the Representative Carol McGuire. Oh, does your member yield to questions? Member does not yield. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to mention that the rosy promises mentioned by the previous speaker are just not going to happen very soon because this is a brand new compact. None of the states that we really want to be involved have joined the compact, like Massachusetts or Florida or New York. They're not even considering it. There are some states considering it, like Vermont and Maine, but the states that are currently in the compact are Missouri, Utah, South Dakota, which are not states we get a large number of social workers for. The other issue is that just last year, we passed a very broad reciprocity bill for licensing. And so if someone, a social worker from another state, wants to come and work in New Hampshire, they come in, show their license from another state, get their criminal background check, and of course pay the fee, and poof, they have a New Hampshire license and they are fully capable of practicing in the state. With the compact, discipline is an issue because we could only restrict someone's ability to practice in New Hampshire. If there were a bad actor among the social workers, they could still practice in all the other compact states unless and until their home state chose to take action. That's a concern. Right now, we can protect ourselves, but we can't protect everybody. And finally, this is a very new compact. By the, this bill, the, that organization has the power to buy and sell real estate, hire people, set their fees, set their rules, which have the force and effect of law, of course. And we don't know what they are. We don't know what their fees are planning to be. We don't know how magnificent a structure they're going to build in uh, Washington, D.C., if it was, were to be approved. But if we vote for the compact now, we're going to be stuck with it. And, you know, a seat at the table may be nice, but we'd be one out of seven or more. And I can't see that our interests are going to overpower the interests of other states and other people. So I think that we are essentially buying into a pig and a poke in the hope that it will help our social work contract, our mental health crisis, and when we have other more reliable methods of getting more social workers and other mental health professionals. I hope you will join with me and the majority of the, of the committee in voting for the ITL. Please press the green button. Representative Sweeney has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is the Majority Committee Report of Inexpedient to Legislate on House Bill 1190. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Grody for a parliamentary inquiry. Chair recognizes Representative Boyd for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the purpose of social work compacts facilitates the interstate practice of regulated social workers by improving public access to competent and professional social work services. And Mr. Speaker, if I know that this compact facilitates continuity of care and maintaining existing patient-provider relationships, then Mr. Speaker, would I press the red button 
so that a different motion may be made to support social work compacts here in New Hampshire. Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Simon for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that what we're voting on today, we have absolutely no idea what we're actually voting on. Um, it hasn't been defined yet. And Mr. Speaker, if I know that um, accountability in this compact from a state level is uncertain to the point at which if there's malpractice in our state, it's uncertain whether or not we would oversee that malpractice in our own courts or that would be ha handled at the federal level. We don't even know that. And Mr. Speaker, if we have pulled out of a compact before in the past because it didn't work out very well, why in the world would we enter a compact before we even know what the compact is? Uh, for those reasons, Mr. Speaker, I would ask that regardless of your concerns about the mental health crisis, which we all share, uh, that this isn't uh, the solution to it at this time, would I press uh, the red button? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Green button, sorry. The motion before us is the Majority Committee Report of Inexpedient to Legislate on House Bill 1190. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present have an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay to the vote. 175 voting yay, 200 voting nay. The majority committee report fails. Senator Grody moves ought to pass. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. No. The ayes have it. And the committee report, minority committee report is adopted. The minority of the majority of the Committee on Executive Department's administration to which was referred House Bill 1222, act relative to physician assistant scope of practice. Having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment, the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Tony Likas for the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report with the recommendation that the bill be referred for interim study. Representative J.C. Grody for the minority of the committee. Representative Kutab, bills on second reading open to further amendment. The committee amendment is 0454H, printed in House Record 12, pages 118 and 119. The question is on the committee amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The committee amendment is adopted. Now it's on second reading. Open to further amendment. Representative Kutab offers floor amendment 1366H. And the chair recognizes Representative Roachford to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for allowing to speak on this amendment before us here. Uh, the amendment is about, and the bill, ultimately, the, the underlying bill is about mid level practitioners, healthcare practitioners. The state of New Hampshire licenses two types of mid level practitioners, and invariably, many, if not most of us, have visited one of those. 
their nurse practitioners, and physician's assistants. While both professions demand rigorous postgraduate education, there exists a notable discrepancy in the administrative burdens they face. Despite more academic credit hours and a larger clinical hour requirement, PAs must engage in a written collaboration agreement upon graduation, unlike nurse practitioners. One might speculate that this stems from nurses' richer clinical backgrounds. However, it's crucial to recognize that even with years of experience, PAs remain tethered to these agreements with physicians. It's worth noting that these agreements often are a mere formality, with collaborating physicians bearing no shared liability with the PAs they're linked to. And in fact, we've heard stories of physicians charging PAs thousands of dollars a year to enter into these agreements. So the amendment before us right now today, has we have an opportunity to fix this and rectify this incongruity and accord our mid-level providers the respect they deserve as professionals that they are. The proposed amendment maintains the necessity of collaboration between PAs and doctors, yet it introduces a pivotal change. After 8,000 hours of clinical practice, the requirement for these agreements to be written is lifted. This amendment was carefully crafted and agreed to by many of the stakeholders involved in this conversation. And I want to thank my colleagues who over the last four or five days worked hard to, to put this together. Um, this amendment is not just a legislative step, it's a statement of acknowledgement and empowerment to our health care providers and a testament to their expertise and autonomy. So I urge you right now to lend your support to this amendment and please vote in favor, favor of the amendment and ultimately in favor of the bill. Thank you. Do you recognize Representative Calabro? She waves off. The motion before us is the Kutab Floor Amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is ought to pass as amended. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Majority of the Committee on Executive Departments and Administration to which was referred House Bill 1271. Act relative to the conversation, con combination, and reorganization of boards and advisory boards. We considered the same, report the same with the recommendation that the bill be referred for interim study. Representative J.C. Grody for the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following amendment and a recommendation the bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Tony Likas for the minority of the committee. The chair recognizes Representative Tony Likas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So this bill converts a number of the occupational licensing boards to advisory from regulatory. The difference is that a regulatory board has the authority to do rulemaking on licensing requirements and to make the decisions on complaints. Well, an advisory board, with, for an advisory board, the authority is with the office. The issue is that a regulatory board consists of people working in a profession, deciding on the requirements, and adjudicating complaints against others in the same profession who are potentially their competitors. This is a particular problem for professions with relatively few licensees. The boards affected by this bill are such pro for such professions. Midwives are the best example of this. There are 33 licensed midwives in the state, and the three on the board make up almost 10% of all those licensed. There have been a number of antitrust suits against states based on the regulatory board form of licensing. One made it to the Supreme Court in 2015 against South Carolina, and the state and the dental licensing board lost the case. There was a significant monetary judgment against both the state and the individual members of the board. There was another antitrust case against a board of acupuncture. The court found against the acupuncture board after the state incurred almost $350,000 in legal fees. 
Licensees were required to pay higher fees to cover those expenses. The cost exceeded all revenue from acupuncture licensing in that state. Higher fees are likely to be the result in New Hampshire since occupational licensing fees are required to cover the costs of licensing. The U.S. Supreme Court held that professional licensing boards comprised primarily of active market participants have immunity from antitrust laws only when they are actively supervised by the state. Advisory licensing boards have this immunity because although they advise the office, they do not have final authority. Regulatory boards have no such immunity. From a Harvard Law Journal article, quote, regulators are therefore advised to be extremely careful. Those who think of themselves as public officials might find that they are sadly mistaken, all the more sadly to the extent that they find themselves having to pay out-of-pocket damages for their to their regulatory victims. Over five states have passed legislation similar to this bill since the U.S. Supreme Court case. Other states have not used uh, regulatory boards even prior to that. Both the problem and the solution are well understood. There is nothing to study. This is an active area of litigation, and it's likely only a matter of time before New Hampshire licensing board is sued and loses. Please join me in acting now and vote red to overturn the interim study recommendation so another motion can be made. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Short. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While the majority of EDNA committee appreciated the heavy work done on the minority amendment, we still do not feel it is ready for passage, and so we are recommending further study. This bill was requested by the Office of Professional Licensure and Certification, OPLC, for several stated reasons. First, that so many of the boards comprise so few members of a given profession that members who serve on the boards would be liable to antitrust lawsuits and charges of conflict of interest, as has happened in one other state that we know of. And to avoid such liability, the state needs to have more oversight. No such suit has happened in New Hampshire, but following the lead of six other states, it was recommended that many of these boards should be repealed, combined, or made advisory. We were also told that many board meetings had not been held because many of the professions could not supply enough board members. During the full committee hearing, we heard from several of the professions that they opposed the bill and refuted the reasoning behind it because while meetings were suspended during the pandemic and were slow to resume, they are getting back to normal since then. Some also did not agree with the argument of too few members causing liability or conflicts. And we are still hearing from many members opposing the minority amendment. For example, the acupuncturists who, according to figures provided by OPLC, have 190 licensees and met six times in 2023. The septic evaluators with 141 licensees met four times last year, and nursing home administrators with 167 licensees met nine times last year. Yes, some of the boards in the amendment are small and did have few or no meetings, but the three I just listed are still included in the amendment. Also included in the amendment is the Guardian Ed Lightum Board, which opposed the bill, stating that they are currently quasi-judicial. Two members appointed by the court, five members appointed by the governor, and two legislators. The amendment, changing it to advisory, pairs it down to an acceptable five members. However, with one member appointed by the court, and the other four nominated by the involved groups, but appointed by the executive director of OPLC. How does that give the state more oversight? OPLC was originally created to provide centralized, efficient, clerical assistance to the various professional 
licensing and regulatory boards in the state. Now that most of these boards have been enfolded into OPLC, that office has grown its presence to include, in many cases, setting license fees, drafting rules, investigating complaints, and even prosecuting disciplinary cases. Our committee often deals with disputes over decisions regarding scope of practice, educational standards, and who should determine these items. We have tried to maintain the rights of those in a particular profession to control those areas. And while the majority of the committee agreed with making some of the boards in the minority amendment advisory, we heard loud and clear that some others still in it need further examination. Be assured that we will work on this to craft a better product. So please allow us to get this right by voting yes on the interim study motion. Thank you. Representative Sweeney has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is to refer for interim study on House Bill 1271. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Carol McGuire for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this, this amendment has been worked on extensively by not only the DNA Committee and the OPLC, but also by members of most of the boards. And if I know that the amendment that we have presented answers the questions and concerns of nearly all the boards, and they have, it, they have agreed to it, and if the issues that were raised at the public hearing for the initial bill have, for the most part, been solved, would I not press the red button so a, another motion can be made? Chair recognize Representative Goley for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that some boards may be better off as advisory due to their smaller size and inability to meet, but Mr. Speaker, if I know that a number of the boards in this bill do not meet this criteria that we have heard of, such as the Boards of Acupuncture, the Board of Nursing Home Administrators, and the Board of Septic System Evaluators. And Mr. Speaker, if I know the majority of the eDNA Committee believes a thorough review of the boards needs to be done to determine which boards should be changed to advisory through an interim study, then Mr. Speaker, would I support the majority of the committee by pushing the green button? The motion before us is refer for interim study on House Bill 1271. This is a roll call vote. If 
you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay the vote. Under 95 voting nay, 181 voting nay. Committee report is adopted. Committee on Executive Departments and Administration to which was referred House Bill 1545 relative to the disposal of state surplus property for affordable housing. Representative Majapudi offers ought to pass. For what reason a member rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to table HB 1545 and I request a roll call vote. Proper motion. Representative Sweeney has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote on the tabling motion of House Bill 1545. Members, take your seats. This is a roll call vote. Motion before us is to table House Bill 1545. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Carol McGuire for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the Housing Authority already has first right of refusal on any surplus property to be used for affordable housing, and if I know that the definition of market value is always a bit subjective. And if I know that there's no need to, to issue an unspecified subsidy to housing without legislative oversight, would I now press the green button and table this bill? Chair, recognize Representative Grody for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the New Hampshire Housing Authority had a say in this bill and actually wrote this bill with, and supported the bill because they feel that nonprofit organizations that work with affordable housing should have an opportunity to purchase sur surplus land for New Hampshire, from New Hampshire. And I think that the debate and the, and the discussions are worthy of our ears, because this is an issue, Mr. Speaker, that has been on our radar for a long time, and we need to address it. Thank you. Motion before us is to table House Bill 1545. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
All members present had an opportunity to vote. I also attend the state of the vote. 190 voting nay, 185 voting nay, 1545 is placed on the table. Majority of the Committee on Finance to which was referred House Bill 1279 FN Local act relative to payment by the state of a portion of retirement system contributions of political subdivision employers. Consider the same, report the same with the following resolution resolved that is inexpedient to legislate. It's enough Ken Weiler from the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report with the recommendation that the bill ought to pass. It's in of Chuck Grassi from the minority of the committee. For what reason is a member rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to table HB 1279 and I request a roll call vote. It's a proper motion. Representative Sweeney has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1279. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Weiler for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that when the state stopped contributing the 35% to the municipal employer's cost of retirement in 2012, that we made up the loss by increasing the employee's contribution, which would be proportional to the increase of employees and their pay. The 35% that we looked at in 2012 Re Re was Representative 60. Weiler, this is a tabling motion, not. Then would I now be in favor of tabling this as unnecessary because we have worked out a way to do it? Thank you. Press the green button. House will be in order. Chair recognize Representative Grassi for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that this was a promise that was made to communities back in 1967 to get communities to join into the retirement system in the state of New Hampshire, and if I know that this is an important bill for all our communities, whether they be Democratic or Republican, council members, board of aldermen, Selectmen, if I know that they want this bill to help relieve the burden on taxpayers, would I now push, push the red button so a further mo motion could be made? The motion before us is to table House Bill 1279. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you oppose, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 182 voting nay, 192 voting nay. Tabling motion fails. Chair recognizes Representative Edgar.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. She was had two different versions of this. I'm glad I get get to give one of them anyway. But uh, yeah, my my name is Mike Edgar, and uh, this bill here is uh, is really for the city and towns. Um, you know, we we. Uh, we had a retirement system back in the 60s. It was like four different ones, and then they got state wanted to combine into one, and uh, the towns and cities agreed, but at the same time, when the uh, state could convince the cities and towns to do it, they promised to uh, subsidize or pay for 40% of what the employer, in this case, the cities and towns, would have to pay. Well, eventually, that got decreased, but I want to remind everybody, this is for the teachers, the police, the firefighters, those are the ones that are getting, uh, getting the retirement, which they're paying quite a bit for because it was increased, as was mentioned earlier. What they're paying is, is, is quite a bit. So basically we had it where the state was going to contribute 40% and then basically get down to 2011 where they pay zero. Uh, my goodness. But the, uh, I first became involved with this when uh, the former uh, representative from Hampton, uh, Rennie Cushing, uh, was bringing this up. He was always trying to get, basically, to stop the downshifting and to uh, get the cities and towns uh, what, what to do them. And this is one of the ones that he really, uh, he was really avid about. And then uh, one of my best uh, memories of this, this whole topic, which we've discussed several times, is when our... Uh, Fighting Leprechaun brought this up two years ago, and we actually got it passed in the House. Uh, Mike O'Brien did a great job, and I think that was uh, that was really something to see. So, the uh, it's mentioned mentioned that uh, property uh, tax relief. Uh, this bill was criticized because it had the words property tax relief in it, and I guess it must be a popular term because. A bill that was put in by the other side, they used the same term, property tax relief. But what they did was they changed it so that there was only one year of it, and that was in 22, 2022, and it was great. Between the towns and the cities, they got about uh, 28 million back. But it's interesting that it also, getting that through, it also had a uh, Business tax relief in it, that was part of that bill. That was put in with it for the one year. But, so, the, uh, basically the state reneged on their, uh, their promise and the towns could really, really use the money. So I hope that the people can uh, see to actually approve this. Basically it won't be to approve the final bill after we, we change it, but vote red on the ITL. And as I say, uh, yatahe, vote red. Do you recognize Representative Dan McGuire? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a perennial bill, and we had the identical bill last year in House Bill 50. When that bill came to the Finance Committee, um, we chose to redirect it for the same purpose, but not as an immediate payment to, to municipalities, but as a pay down to the unfunded liability of the pension system. That's a slow way and steady way of improving the pension system over the long haul, rather than a shot in the arm uh, for this year's municipalities. So um, that's, what we, that's what we passed. It was passed by a very strong vote on the House floor. We put it into the budget. Unfortunately, it was ripped out by the, our friends on the other side of the wall. Um, and because we did not go to a committee of conference, that was the end of it for last year. It's something that in the committee of conference, we would have argued for strongly. This year, earlier this year, we repurposed House Bill 436 to be exactly that, the exact same thing, this bill as modified to pay down the unfunded liability. 
That bill is now on the other side of the wall, and they have not yet acted on it. I have high, you know, I've already spoken to them about it. I have high hopes that, that it may um, go forward in some form. The problem is we have already given them a very heavy lift on the general fund uh, this year. We have a much more important bill that we've already sent to um, enhance Group 2 liability features, and we have House Bill 436, which is the pay down of the unfunded liability. If we add to it essentially the same bill in this bill, that's yet another big chunk of the general funds, and I think it will cause them to, um, to not pass our other important bills, which we have already sent them. You know, it, it'll be just a, too heavy of a lift um, for their finance committee, and it, as it would be for ours. So please, let's honor the decision that this body has already made and um, give our, um, our attention and our force to lowering the unfunded liability. That helps everyone, every municipality, the state, in the long run, which is important. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Edgar has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. The motion before us is a majority committee report of inexpedient to legislate. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Grassley for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that back in 1967, the state of New Hampshire promised communities a 40% share if they, brought, if they joined the retirement system. And if I know that in a strange quirk in 2011, this House and the legislative body removed that contribution, and it became a zero uh, support for the communities. And if I know that what goes on on the other side of the wall is their business, and what happens on this side of the wall is our business, and that this bill will be back again if we do not do this this year, because our city councils, our board of aldermen, our selectmen have requested this year after year after year. This is nonpartisan. If I know that this 7.5% will make up for that, will basically bring back some of that promise that we had for our communities and help reduce taxes, would I now push the red button so that we could get to ought to pass and move this forward? Chair recognized Representative Weiler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
If I know that in 2012, the lack of money going to the municipalities for the retirement contribution was made up by the task of making the employees pay the difference. That system has been stable for 13 years, and the employees are still paying about less than half of what the employer pays. So if that system has been going on for 13 years, why suddenly is there a travail about its effect on taxes? And finally, if I know that the Constitution Bill of Rights for New Hampshire in Article 36 says, pensions will never be paid for more than one year, will I please stop hearing about broken promises? Press the green button to balance budgets. Thank you. The motion before us, Majority Committee Report of Inexpedient to Legislate on House Bill 1279. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 178 voting yay, 194 voting nay. Motion fails. Representative Grassi moves ought to pass. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye! Opposed nay? No! The ayes have it. Bye. 194 to 178. For what reason does the member rise? Uh, to make a motion. House will be in order. Actually, I'd like to ask that the, the remarks from the last bill be entered into the permanent journal, please. Without objection. Committee on Finance, to which was referred House Bill 1323 FNA, the act making an appropriation for the printing costs of the New Hampshire State Constitution. Having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation of the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Ken Weiler for the committee. The amendment is 0909H, printed in House Record 12, pages 140 through 141. The motion is on the amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Committee on Health and Human Services and Elderly Affairs, to which was referred House Bill 1280 relative to informed consent and parental rights, comes to us without recommendation. Representative McLean moves ought to pass. Chair recognizes Representative Bill Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition to HB 1280. Informed consent is a critical aspect of patient care and is integral to the physician's code of context, ethics. However, this bill would put into New Hampshire statute informed consent procedures and patient rights that are already in federal requirements through CMS 
which establishes consent standards and provides enforcement mechanisms. There are also accrediting bodies that dictate consent policies, and we also have informed consent requirements in New Hampshire law, RSA 151.32. Therefore, HB 1280 is unnecessary at best. This law could create additional regulations and possibly conflicts with federal laws and rules already in an already heavily regulated area of medicine. The patient's rights provisions in this bill seem already to be covered in New Hampshire's Bill of Rights, RSA 151.21. Most physicians I've spoken to are concerned that this would add more administrative burden and would take time from direct patient care and agree that we should not codify medical practice. This is an area where we should align with national standards and not make practice in New Hampshire more of a minefield. I already spend more time learning new rules in EMR operations and less and less time to update my actual medical knowledge. If practice in New Hampshire becomes harder than in surrounding states, we will likely lose physicians to those states. Finally, I propose I proposed interim study in the HS, HS committee because it was not clear to me that there was a significant problem that needed remediation and that we want health providers to be able to control how they meet current consent guidelines and not have a one-size-fits-all approach etched into law. Please oppose the OTP so we can move to interim study and find out if there's a real problem that warrants making a new law. Thank you. Chair recognized Representative McLean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, HB 1280 statutorily defines informed consent and patients' rights in the context of a doctor patient relationship. And the language of the bill draws directly from the AMA guidelines and codifies the minimum, the minimum best practices in the delivery of health care. As a result, many on the Health and Human Services Committee felt that this was a very light lift and it would result in a very mild burden for those working in the health care sector. Now, as if to reinforce that position, the opposing committee report stated that, and I quote, the bill would put into statute informed consent procedures and patient rights that are already standard practice in New Hampshire and in the nation. So, already standard practice. Apparently the two sides on this bill already agreed on some stuff and, and that's a good beginning that I can work with. But where the two sides differed was on the need to put these practices into statute. The opposing side felt that while the language is in line with ideal medical practice, Things like assessing a patient's ability to understand their treatment is an immeasurable burden that will increase liability concerns and cast a shadow on recruitment to the medical profession if it was passed into law. And this is where I personally separate myself from the other side. In my opinion, there can be no true consent without understanding. And the requirement to assess a patient's ability to understand is fundamental. There can be no consent without it. But this bill isn't needed because doctors don't want to provide informed consent or good follow-up care. The fact is that those who enter into the medical field have always been some of the most caring and dedicated professionals in the whole of our society. Of course, they want to provide these things to their patients, and they're not the problem. No, the bill is needed because in the last 30 years, an enormous administrative infrastructure has grown up around health care that wants to turn everything into a process and then lean it out. And my friends, that can work with a lot of things. But one of the things it can't work with is a conversation between a doctor and a patient. And the final result of this approach is that the best practices that both sides agree upon are often being executed in a perfunctory manner in order to just check a box. And that's not only strangling patients, it's strangling doctors as well. And there needs to be a break on it. So as such, this bill is actually a tool for patients 
to demand more than a perfunctory review and for doctors to push back against an administration that might have lost sight of the core mission that they serve. So the opponents of the bill will say they're always looking to improve consent. And as such, there's no need to put these practices in the statute. Well, okay. But the question is, how well has that been working? And to me, the answer is, not very well. The fact is that while there are plenty of incentives for patients and doctors to seek reform, those incentives just don't carry over to the administrative elements of the healthcare system. So I really think we're just now at a place where we need to have an external statutory bump if you truly want to shift the trajectory. So everyone in this hall has been a patient at one time or another. So I want all of you who are old enough to think on this. Look back on the conversations, relationships, and the follow-up care that you had 30 years ago and compare it to the kind of relationships and discussions that you're having today. And if you think it's better now, then by all means, feel free to oppose this bill. But if you feel like me, that we're losing something really important in healthcare as we perpetually try to lean it out, I hope you'll join with me in supporting this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion before us is ought to pass on House Bill 1280. Who requested the roll call? Senator Cushman. Senator Cushman requests the roll call. Is that officially seconded? It is officially seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is ought to pass on House Bill 1280. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Weber for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know in those dear dead nostalgic days, I asked my health care provider one question, and his answer to me was, if you want me to teach you medicine, my fee is a million dollars a minute. And if I know we've progressed a long way since then. But if I know that this bill does not promote greater understanding, it just adds to the process and the paperwork and therefore takes away from patient care. And if I know that informed consent is not a one-size-fits-all uh, operation because every process is different and requires a different sort of explanation, would I now press the red button so a different motion could be made? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative McLean for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the requirements laid out in HB 1280 are pulled directly from the American Medical Association's guidelines for best practice, and if I know that in the last few decades a huge administrative infrastructure has grown up around health care that needs to be addressed if we want to see these best practices carried out in fact and not just on paper, and if I know that this bill gives a needed statutory push to shift the health care sector into greater alignment with these practices, would I now press the green button to show my support? The motion before us is ought to pass on House Bill 1280. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
Representative Grossman. All members present have an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay the vote. 189 voting nay, 190, 181 voting nay. Committee report is adopted. For what reason do the member rise? Uh, having voted on the prevailing side, I move reconsideration of House Bill 1279 and urge my colleagues to vote no. I request a division vote. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The motion before us is to reconsider House Bill 1279. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay to the vote. 179 voting nay, 194 voting nay. The motion fails. <laughs> Committee on Health and Human Services and Elderly Affairs to which was referred House Bill 1568 FN relative to Medicaid reimbursement for non-transport emergency medical service calls. This comes without recommendation. Representative Weber moves ought to pass. Chair recognizes Representative Leon. This will be a division vote. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is ought to pass on House Bill 1568. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Leon for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this bill deals with Medicaid reimbursement for non-transport, if I know that a more complete bill will soon be in our committee, and if I know the concern around um, lift assist calls 
will be able to ha be handled specifically at that point. Would I then vote against the OTP motion by pressing the red button? Chair recognizes Representative Weber. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as has been said here before, if I know that what happens in other places is their business, but this is our business, and this is a simple bill that simply requires reimbursement for actual medical services offered by EMTs, and if I know that the result of passing the bill for Medicaid reimbursement will be a benefit to our EMT services and our town taxpayers, would I now vote green on the ought to pass to preserve all of our options so we'll have everything to consider as we go forward? Thank you. Motion before us ought to pass on House Bill 1568. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. While well, members present had an opportunity to vote, House will attend the state of the vote. 237 voting yay, 136 voting nay. The committee report is adopted. For what reason does the member rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to lay House Bill 1607 on the table. Oh, I'm sorry. The majority of the Committee on Health, Human Services, and Elderly Affairs to which was referred to House Bill 1607, an act relative to expanded safe haven protections Having considered the same, report the same with the recommendation that the bill be referred for interim study. Representative Lucy Weber from the majority of the committee. The minority of the committee having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Jim Kofalt for the minority of the committee. For what reason does the member rise? Now the member rises for a motion to lay the bill on the table. Representative Weber moves that House Bill 1607 be laid on the table. You ready for the question? Yes. Representative Hull requests a roll call, and it's well seconded. This will be a roll call. The question is whether to lay House Bill 1607 on the table, and this is a roll call vote. Representative Weber is recognized for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that everybody wants babies to be safe and cherished, and if I know that the numerous questions raised by this bill include the problem of leaving a 61-day period in which a child might be abused and then 
because of changes in the laws of evidence, that abuse might never be addressed either civilly or criminally. Would I now press green on the tabling motion and we'll go to work for this in the future? Representative Petternell is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that our 20-year-old safe haven law is in dire need of updating, if I know that with the increased use of illegal drugs that we are likely to see more and more babies surrendered, if we do not surrender those babies safely, they may end up dead somewhere, as we have seen in the past. If I know that evidence can be obtained in ways other than the surrender of the child, and that the New Hampshire Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys supports this bill, if I know that this bill has bipartisan sponsorship and committee support, and that saving a baby's life should take precedence over prosecuting a struggling mother, would I please press the red button to, and not table this bill so that another motion can be made. The question is whether the House Bill 1607 on the table. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present have not had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 183 in the affirmative, 187 in the negative. Tabling fails. One-on-one -on -one debate. Representative Petronell is recognized to speak against the report, uh, against the motion. Hold up. We got amendments. No, no, that's only if it's overturned. Oh, got it. Yep, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Imagine a woman who is a serious criminal, surrounded by drug abuse and violence, giving birth to a baby. This mother does not want or cannot handle the responsibility of raising this child. She would welcome an opportunity to anonymously wash her hands of the baby and surrender it to someone else. Some parents who surrender their infants may be heroic, but this woman is no hero. She wants to surrender the baby for one reason, because it would be in her own self-interest to be free of this child. But it is ultimately in the best interest of the baby to allow an option of anonymous surrender. Danielle Dauphiné surrendered her baby to a New Hampshire hospital in 2021. Instead of keeping Dauphiné's identity anonymous, that hospital reported her to the police, which led directly to her arrest for a separate murder charge and a litany of other crimes. In other words, New Hampshire's safe haven law was used as a law enforcement tool. We need to update our safe haven law so mothers know that they can surrender their baby free from fear of arrest. If a mother realizes that by safely surrendering her baby, the hospital will report her identity to the police, who then pursue and investigate her, she may not come forward to surrender her baby. Instead, she might keep the baby out of fear of arrest. What will happen to the baby? We know what will happen. 
as long as our safe havens are used as a tool of law enforcement to catch criminal parents, then that baby might die, be neglected, or, like Dauphiné's first child, live a short life of unspeakable abuse. There is a critical difference between babies and our other constituents. There is a critical difference between this issue and most of the issues we consider in this house. A helpless baby cannot drive to another state with better safe haven laws. Only we can give parents every incentive to save these babies. This bill will expand, expand the age window in which parents can surrender their child and allow the optional construction of baby boxes to better protect infants and the anonymity of their parents. As the New Hampshire Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys has explained, this is no different from other areas where we restrict the tools that law enforcement can use. Our laws exclude evidence obtained from illegal searches, but this does not mean we want criminals to go free. It means the police must use other tools, not illegal searches, to catch those criminals. In the same way, police must use other tools to catch criminals besides baby safe havens. What is more critical, punishing criminals or saving babies' lives? Your most vulnerable and innocent constituents need you. If you have concerns with this bill, help us continue the conversation and let them be addressed on the other side of the wall. Speak for those who cannot speak for themselves and join us in protecting them by pressing the red button to overturn the motion for interim study. Representative Weber is recognized to speak for the committee report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So you've heard a number of most excellent points in favor of this bill. And I understand all of those arguments and I agree with them. But there's another side as well, so let's look at the bill. Currently, anybody can surrender a baby within five days of birth by giving a warm handoff to a hospital, EMT, fire station, police station, a church, whatever. The bill would change that to 61 days for surrender. And it has the anonymous use of the baby box as a protection and an incentive for the parent to surrender the child anonymously. And I understand all of those arguments. But here is the other side of the question. Oh, and, and the third thing is, the, of course, it limits the liability to prosecution, either civilly or criminally, for acting under the act. So here's the other side of the question. First off, somebody who is so deep in the depths of addiction or poverty or mental illness that they are considering surrendering a baby may not even know that this law exists, may not know it's available to them, and may not be organized enough to take advantage of the law, and that is a tragedy. Secondly, for a parent who is in despair because of their circumstances and the arrival of an infant, what could be better than a warm handoff at a place where there are people who might offer support, offer comfort, offer help, and prevent a parent in a moment of despair from doing something that they will regret for the rest of their lives. Third,
one of the things I found the most troubling with this bill was that part of our hearing on the bill really amounted to an infomercial by the manufacturer of these devices who made it very clear that he was making it his mission in life to change all the laws in all the states. And yes, there's nothing that requires that his devices be used, but he's the only person who's doing it at the moment. Finally, there is that thorny issue of liability. If this bill passes, there is the very real possibility that someone, not necessarily the mother, could be abusing a child for 60 days and then could possibly put that comatose and battered infant into a box and escape criminal prosecution. And imagine the howls from our constituents if that happens. There is a great deal to admire about this legislation. Uh, there's a great deal to be worked on in this legislation. So I would urge you to support the interim study so we can continue to work on the bill and bring back a better product with more of those questions resolved. Thank you. Does the member yield for a question? No. The member does not yield. All right. The question is the Majority Committee Report of Interim Study on House Bill 1607. This will be a division vote. Members, take your seats. Representative Hull requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is. This will be a roll call vote. Still take your seats. The questions on the report of interim study on House Bill 1607. The House should be in order. This is a roll call vote. Representative Mays is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Hello. Representative Mays is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that safe haven boxes are being used in 16 other states and that we want to lead New England in child protections, and if I know that evidence can be obtained in ways other than from the surrender of the child, and that the New Hampshire Association of Criminal Defense Law supports the bill, and I also know that there was no manufacturer at the hearing because I was there and they were not doing an infomercial. And lastly, if I know this bill has bipartisan sponsorship and committee support, and that saving a baby's life should take precedence over prosecuting a struggling mother, 
Would I please press the red button to overturn the interim study so a better motion can be made? Thank you. Representative Weber is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. If, thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that we all want to protect infants, and if I know... The House will be in order. Look, I know I let a lot of stuff slide, but just for once can remember who we are, where we are, and give this subject matter the gravity it deserves. Please continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And if I know that I want to protect a suffering mother or parent, but I don't want to protect an abusive person, and if I know that you can't have it both ways, you can't say that this bill will allow people to go free and clear, so they of course will adopt this procedure, and also argue that they can also be uh, brought to answer for their actions in other ways, would I now vote green to support the interim study so we can resolve the questions and bring back a better bill next time around? Thank you. The questions on the committee report of interim study on House Bill 1607. It's a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 182 in the affirmative, 189 in the negative. The motion fails. Representative Kofalt moves off to pass on House Bill 1607. Representative, Representative Cordelli moves Floor Amendment 1351H, which can be found in your seat pockets. And Representative Petternell is recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that Floor Amendment 1351H. Oh, you can just talk. It doesn't have to be a PI. <laughs> oh, what a relief. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Amendment 1351H simply adds I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. At the beginning of uh, it simply adds a list of findings at the beginning of the amendment and also changes the name of the safe haven baby box to a safe haven baby, uh, just to a baby box. It can be any device. It is not incorporated. It is not patented. It is not trademarked. We could machine fat manufacture them right here in New Hampshire if we needed to. Thank you. The questions on the adoption of the amendment. You ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye! All those opposed nay? No! The ayes have it and the amendment's adopted. Now the question is on the main motion of ought to pass as amended. 
Representative Seth King is recognized to speak against the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Friends, I have something very important to say here. This bill, um, I really like the vast majority of this bill. I like the baby boxes. I liked the increasing the number of days, and that had bipartisan support. The main problem is with a very small section of the bill, which is referred to as the exclusionary clause. And what this does is it allows individuals to abuse, including sexually abusing children, for up to 61 days, drop them off, and have a get out of jail free card. That is a bridge too far for me, okay? And when I brought this up in committee, we had enough support, including on the Republican side, to say, you know what, that's also a bridge too far for me as well. That's why we originally supported the interim study bill. And the problem is, in the last minute, leadership has decided to switch around and say, no, we want to fight for the bill completely. Let me ask you a question. If somebody kidnapped a child right now, and the child was missing for three weeks, would the police ever come out on the media and say, you know what, just bring back the child. We don't care what you've done to it in the last three weeks. We will let you off scot-free. Would we, would we ever do that? No, they wouldn't. They would never do that. We will prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. We cannot tolerate child abusers. And the problem is, is that if you ever were to say something like this, you would give, it would be a clarion call to all of the would-be abusers out there. All you have to do is bring back the child and we'll let you off scot-free, no matter what you've done to it. So what I would recommend is to not support the OTP. It's very unfortunate because uh, me and some other representatives worked very hard with the authors of the bill, and we said, hey, let's have a compromise here. I'm perfectly fine. We were perfectly fine with saying, look, if you're drug addicted, then we're not going to come after you. All right? I've been against the war on drugs my entire life. I don't want a drug addicted mother to, to be afraid of dropping off her baby and then getting busted. That, that is not what I want. But if you are sexually abusing children, if you are breaking their bones and brutalizing them, we will come after you with the fullest extent of the law. We cannot tolerate that. And the problem is this sends the wrong message, and we're going to send a clarion call to everybody out there who is a would-be abuser. You have 61 days. Matter of fact, there was a bit, there was a, um, there, just a couple of days ago, there was a mother who was found... Uh, who was busted for pimping out her newborn child to sexual predators. There is real evil in the world. People will take advantage of this, and I don't want my hands on this bill at all. So I would say, please, send the bill back. Let's fix that. We need some compromise. We, can't just have a, we cannot just have a free-for-all. That is unacceptable. And as a Republican, that's just embarrassing. Thank you. Representative Pedernal is recognized to speak in support of the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill provides a requirement that within 24 hours of receiving a report, the department shall request law enforcement officials to investigate the incident, including by using the National Crime Information Center database to determine if the child is missing. And as for the exclusionary rule, this uses the Fourth Amendment. Under the Fourth Amendment, criminal investigations cannot directly result from an illegal search. The exclusionary rule prevents the government from using most evidence gathered in violation of the United States Constitution. For example, the decision in Miranda versus Arizona established that the exclusionary rule applies to improperly elicited self-incriminatory statements and to evidence gained in situations where the government violated the defendant's Sixth Amendment right to counsel. Some of these individuals should be investigated or imprisoned, but should not be um, discouraged from legally abandoning their babies. Remember, this is about saving the babies, not prosecuting the parents. Find them some other way. Arrests due to the safe haven drop-off have led to a decrease in abandonments and an increase in abandoned infant death. The question is on the motion of ought to pass as What reason does a member I have a question for the speaker. Is section five, now that we've adopted this amendment, something that can be separated out so that we pass sections one through four and section six?
Yes, it's divisible. Then, Mr. Speaker, I would move to divide the, the amendment that we adopted, removing Section 5, and pass Sections 1 through 4 and 6. Okay, so the question is, shall Section 5 be divided? The question is, shall Section 5 be divided? Are you ready for the question? Representative Hull is recognized to... Okay. The clerk is recognized to explain the motion. Mr. Speaker, the question is, shall the, the bill be divided? What that would mean is sep Section 5 that Representative Hull is asking to be divided means that we would vote on them separately if you vote yes to divide it. So Sections 1 through 4 and Section 6 would be a standalone motion and then subsequently a division, uh, a, a, if the division is successful, then Section 5 would be voted on separately. So they would be, you can, you can adopt one without adopting the other. To be clear, you cannot table one or the other because that tables the whole bill. So the first question is whether or not you want to divide. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye! All those opposed nay? No! Keep the doors closed. Let's do a division vote. Yeah, don't let any other, other members in. This is for clarification. The question is whether to divide Section 5. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All right, have all members present had an opportunity to vote? I also attend to the state of the vote. 290 in the affirmative, 82 in the negative. The question shall be divided. <laughs> All righty. Now, the question is, shall sections 1 through 4 and 6 be adopted? Are you ready for the question? This will be a division vote. If anybody is outside, they're allowed to come in, though. Representative Dry requests a roll call, and it's sufficiently seconded. It'll be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats.
question is, shall we adopt sections one through four and six? This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor of that, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. of all members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will attend to the state of the vote. What? They said. Representative, you asked to be excused. You were excused for the rest of the day. Sorry. Give me your thumbs up or down, please. Thank you. All good now? All righty. 372 in the affirmative and one nay. The motion's adopted. The question is now, shall we adopt section five? The question now is, shall we adopt section five? Are you ready for the question? Oh, Representative Weber requested a roll call. All right, and Representative Dry requests a roll call. That's sufficiently seconded. Let's do another roll call vote. Members, take your seats. The question is whether to adopt Section 5. Representative Perrinell is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Speaker, if I know that Section 5 is the most important part of this bill, that without the exclusionary rule, parents are going to dump their babies in dumpsters, kill them on the side of the road, let them suffocate in Couches. House will be in order. If I know that without this exclusionary rule, the bill has no teeth, would I now vote green? The question is whether to adopt Section 5. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will attend to the state of the vote. 185 in the affirmative, 188 in the negative. The motion fails. Without objection, the clerk is authorized to renumber the bill accordingly.
So the house will be in order. Majority of the Committee on Municipal and County Government to which was referred House Bill 1181, act relative to solid waste districts. Consider the same, report the same with the following amendment, a recommendation to bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Jim Maglory for the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, a report with the following amendment, and a recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Josh O'Kella for the minority of the committee. The majority amendment is 1054H, printed in House Record 12, pages 115. The chair recognizes Representative O'Kella. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in staunch opposition to the proposed amendment, which my humble opinion uh, possesses a grave threat to the financial responsibility we are entrusted to uphold. This amendment and its ambiguous language grants waste districts to exceed their budgets without adequate checks and balances by permitting overspending in circumstances as vague as unusual circumstances arise. Furthermore, it's essential to highlight that the proposed amendment actually references the existing solution uh, to unforeseen expenses, which are not emergencies, and that uh, provided under current law, which is a contingency fund. Waste districts already have access to these funds uh, of, of the creation of a fund um, to address these unexpected costs that fall outside of the scope of their budget allocations. Instead of creating this vague language, waste districts should be encouraged to utilize the contingency fund when faced with unusual circumstances that are not true emergencies. As representatives of the people, it is our solemn duty to ensure the transparency and accountability in government spending allow waste districts to bypass the municipality's refusal to pay increased costs and seek a recourse through the Department of Revenue under the guise of unusual circumstances undermines the very principles of the fiscal prudence that our constituents rely on, upon us to uphold. We owe that, that heart we owe it to hardworking taxpayers at the New Hampshire, uh, of New Hampshire to reject this amendment and instead pursue solutions that prioritize financial responsibility while addressing legitimate emergencies in a measured and transparent manner. I implore my esteemed colleagues to stand firm on their commitment to responsible government and vote against this ill-conceived amendment and wait for the next amendment, which does not have this vague language in it. Thank you. <laughs> Chair, I recognize Representative Veyu for to speak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, to understand what, what's going on here, you have to understand what a solid waste district is. Solid waste districts are what towns and communities have joined together to, to form to take care of landfills, to take care of transfer stations, to take care of the waste services in their communities. These districts contract with waste disposal sites like the incinerators with landfills, sometimes they own landfills like Amherst and uh, up in the, the uh, in Coas County, and they cannot just stop operating when things happen where they might have to blow their budget. During COVID, this came really close for a couple of them, I know it did. And if it hadn't been for ARPA funds and for towns that could help make up the deficit, some of these places would have had to stop collecting trash, they would have had to stop accepting material into landfills. The language in this bill comes directly from the language that already exists for school districts and municipalities. It is a, a last resort. If you can't, if you, if things happen and you can't keep functioning, if the, the world conspires against you and there are catastrophes that you can't control, you can't just stop operating. You can't stop, you can't freeze your budget and shut down the landfill. You can't freeze your budget and stop taking trash at the transfer station. These are problems. All this bill does is borrows language that's already existing in two places in the, in the, in the law. It's important, it is critical to continue these operations, and it's, it's something that hasn't happened. It's just a last resort, it's a fail safe. It's something that during COVID, Solid Waste District said, what would happen if? That's all this is, is a what would happen if. 
there would be no last resort like community, like municipalities and, and school districts have. In order to access this, these funds, they would have to have, already have a reserve fund. And most of them do because they manage landfills. They, they have to handle the, the engineering and the compliance. They have to have something set aside for that. So they already have access to this money. They don't have access to, to your tax dollars. They don't have access to the town contingency funds. They're not part of the town. They're a separate political entity. They own land. They can incur debt. They can do everything a municipality can do without the municipality. They are their own political entity. So this stuff, this, this is really critical. If COVID happens again and the towns can't help make up the deficit, what are we supposed to do with the trash? Where does it go? This is a fail-safe. This isn't something that happens every day. This isn't, isn't permission for them to blow their budgets. This is just, you know, the world is falling apart. There are, you know, geopolitical problems. China shut down recycling a few years ago. That caused a lot of problems because we rely on revenue to take care of these from those commodities. So that put us in a, in a tight spot. So this is just a last resort. There are a couple other pieces of this that are just common sense management. Um, I hope you can support this bill. It is important. Solid waste districts are important. They do a lot for our communities. They help us save us a lot of money on, on disposal and help preserve the lives of our landfills and our disposal facilities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion before us is Amendment 1054H. A division has been requested. Members, take your seats. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is floor amendment is amendment 1054H. This is a division vote. Chair recognized Representative O'Calla for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that there is a better amendment coming after this, and that if I know that the, uh, sorry, okay, <laughs> if I know that uh, the uh, the la vague language in this amendment is not necessary, then would I now hit the red button? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Chair recognizes Representative Veyu for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that solid waste districts are an important part of our community and municipality management system, and that this amendment is important, would I now press the green button to, to pass the committee amendment? Thank you. The motion before us is Majority Committee Amendment 1054. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. While well, members present have an opportunity to vote, House will attend the state of the vote. 223 voting nay, 136 voting nay. The majority amendment is adopted. Bills on second reading open to further amendment. Representative O'Kella moves Amendment 1048H, printed in House Record 12, page 114. Chair, recognize Representative Ayu. So this wait amendment minute, is wait, quite simple. Ocala, just, wait a oh, minute. Sorry. No, you're not up yet. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this amendment coming up removes two-thirds of this bill and all the critical parts that make this bill important to solid waste districts. Um, everything you just voted on would be removed. I, I hope that you uh, can see fit to keep the amendment intact by defeating this amendment. Please vote no. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair, recognize Representative McCullough. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So this amendment uh, removes the vague language and removes uh, those contingencies that the previous speaker said, oh, we don't really need it unless there's a, a pandemic or something like that. This actually addresses the real pr issue, which is that if there was a big producer of waste inside of the waste district and they need to direct instead of just accept that uh, waste, that they are allowed to do so. So I hope you would... Uh, uh, vote in favor of this amendment. Thank you. Division. Division. Representative Weber has requested a division. This will be a division vote. Members, take your seats.
The motion before us is the Minority Committee Amendment 1048. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present had the opportunity to vote, House will tend to stay to the vote. 149 voting nay, 216 voting nay, the amendment fails. And now we're back to auto pass as amended. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. No. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Majority of the Committee on Municipal and County Government to which was referred House Bill 1223. An act relative to governing body members of the Budget Committee. Having considered the same, report the same on the following amendment and recommendation bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Lori Stubb is for the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, we report with the following resolution resolved that it is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Joshua Calla for the minority of the committee. For what reason does a member rise? I'd like to make a motion to table. State your motion to table. Yes. The motion, motion to table is in order. The motion before us now is to table House Bill 1223. A division has been requested. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1223. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Vicello for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the committee amendment um, brought by concerned citizens regarding gaming establishment uh, is, is uh, just an effort to ban uh, gaming across the state, and if I know that rushing the enactment of the amendment without proper vetting through more familiarity uh, with the committee with more familiarity than uh, in gaming licenses like Wayne's and Means uh, is not appropriate. If I know that with a moratorium with additional gaming licenses currently in place and an opportunity to refer the matter to an appropriate committee that there is no immediate urgency allowing 
thorough examination and consideration of the broader implications, would I vote green? Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Chair, recognize Representative Stavis for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that there was nothing rushed at all about our committee's consider consideration of this bill, if I know that communities across the state deserve and are entitled to enabling legislation to determine wheth whether they want casinos in their community or not, w would I now press the red button to vote against this tabling motion so that the proper debate on this thoroughly vetted bill can be brought forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1223. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will tend to stay to the vote. 166 voting nay, 196 voting nay. Tabling motion fails. We are now back to the committee amendment. 1218H, printed in House Record 12, pages 19 to 120. Chair recognize Representative uh, Roachford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, let me tell you about this amendment about what it's not, because there's some confusion out there about what this does. So first of all, this amendment is not about gambling. It's not a gambling, it doesn't have anything to do with gambling licenses. It's not an unprecedented action, what we're going to be debating right now. It's something that has been done and is, is in law now. It's not a revenue generating bill and it's not an expenditure bill. This is a, has nothing to do with, with funds. This bill will not hurt New Hampshire charities. And the timing of this bill is not bad. So the genesis of this, and I understand it was a non-germane amendment that came, uh, came through um, municipal and county committee, but the genesis stems from a request made by some of my constituents to our town officials for a local option vote on casino gambling. You see, seven year, several years ago, our town voted to permit casino operators and my constituents assumed the same local option applied to other games of chance. So this winter, they approached the, the, the planning board and the zoning board, and much to everyone's surprise, when they checked the law, the, the local option did not, was not, did, did, didn't stand for casino gambling. So they had it for, we have it for kino gambling, but they don't have it for casino gambling. So, much like a zoning ordinance, a local option empowers a community to determine what is best for them, for their community. Recognizing that these facilities entail considerable investment, millions of dollars to build these, the amendment we're talking about includes safeguards to ensure that current operators and approved future operators are not blindsided by any changes and the state will not pull the rug out from somebody who's made a considerable investment into these communities. The timing of this bill, this enabling bill, is crucial because there's a specific gaming moratorium in New Hampshire that's set to expire. And the status of some of the other moratorium bills that are being debated right now is uncertain. So ensuring the effectiveness 
of this bill by July 1st, 2024, when the current moratorium expires, is essential for our responsible consideration of our New Hampshire cities and towns. So moreover, this, I want to point out, is a bipartisan bill. The, the vote is bipartisan. It came out with a 15 to 5 majority. One of the most important parts of this is this amendment has received the approval of the New Hampshire charitable gaming operators. So all the parties involved in this are in agreement. Um, they, and, and the Charitable Gaming Operators Association are committed to being good neighbors and want the communities where they operate to feel comfortable with their facilities and their businesses. So in essence, HB 1223 and the amendment that we're talking about today is about empowering local communities to make decisions that align with their values and needs while also providing stability and support for gaming operators. It's a balanced approach that merits our support and you can bet I'm going to hit the green button. For those that have you left in the chamber, snacks have been delivered out in the ante room and they will be replenished when they run out. And just a reminder, there is no food or drink in the chamber. Chair recognizes Representative Yokella. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to address one of the things that was just said, and that is that this is a local option. It doesn't change anything. It's just allowing municipalities to choose. That's wrong. It's just wrong. That right now, if a, if a municipality allows gaming in their zoning, because that's how it's currently regulated by the, by the towns, if they currently allow it, the passage of this negates that. It's automatically disallowed in the entire state. Congratulations. It's not a local option. You're saying not only is it banned in the entire state, if you want the gaming establishment, you have to pass a specific Warren article saying that it is allowed, that is, that is dictated inside of the statute. So no, no town has currently done that because they're allowed to regulate it through zoning now. What we have is a situation where someone didn't regulate it out of, the, out of their town through zoning and are complaining that they didn't regulate it out by zoning. And now they want a statewide ban and you, your municipalities will have to come back and say, okay, now we're going to allow it. And it's going into effect right away. It's not giving you time to you know, say like, hey, I wanna make, make this uh, uh, warrant article on my next ballot. No, it's, it's banned right away. Before the voters ha and your local municipality have had the cho choice or opportunity to ever vote on it. For that reason alone, it's not a local option. It's a mandate and you should vote against it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes David Page. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So my constituents, like my colleague from Littleton's, have considered the question of whether to allow Kino in the town of Conway. In fact, we've done it five times. And each time the question has come before the voters in my town, they've rejected it soundly. Most recently, just last year, more than 75% of my constituents voted down yet another Warren article to allow Kino. It's a striking and consistent message from the townspeople. And yet, paradoxically, my constituents find themselves facing a situation where the decision as to whether or not our town should host a casino is out of our hands. It's absurd. The idea that while we can repeatedly exercise our statutory right to refuse Kino, we have no say in whether a casino sets up shop in our backyard. And this incongruity is what we seek to fix with this bill today. 
And contrary to what the last speaker said, we can't wind back the clock in towns like mine where the ship has already sailed. We are going to have a casino. But this bill will ensure that other towns, maybe your town, are given the courtesy of a choice that my constituents never received. This is not an anti-gambling bill. It's about fundamental principles of local governance. It's about giving communities like mine, like yours, that courtesy of a choice. This bill just extends to casinos the same local option we have for Keno through the Warren article process. In small towns across New Hampshire, in places like Conway and Littleton, we've seen firsthand the frustration of our constituents when they realize with shock what little control they have over such a significant decision. A decision sometimes affecting the very character of the heart of their downtown. This bill offers a solution. And I'm pleased that the gaming industry came to the table in this process and worked with the sponsors and committee, ensuring an approach that is fair and reasonable for operators. This bill doesn't jeopardize operators' existing investments. It simply ensures that in the future, the decision to move forward will be made with the input and consent of host communities. With the current moratorium set to expire imminently, we need to act decisively now to ensure that towns across New Hampshire are guaranteed this choice that they deserve. Please join me in supporting the amendment. Thank you. A division has been requested. Members, take your seats. The motion, the motion before us is floor amendment 1218H. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Ukella for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this is an outright ban and overriding of municipalities, local zoning as far as uh, gaming, and if I know that this is directly brought by a municipality that their charter says that gaming is an inherent evil, and that if I know that this is uh, really should be uh, not a non-germane amendment and should, and because of the uh, uh, the moratorium should just be filed like a regular bill and go through the the regular process, would I now vote red? on this uh, amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair, recognize Representative Len Turcott for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know this bill would add language to our RSAs for games of chance, similar to the existing language in our RSAs for casinos, uh, for Kino, if I also know that the Bart Potterson sponsors worked in concert with the charity casino operators and have agreed to the language that is before you, if I know that this is not an anti-gambling bill, but it is a bill about local control and has zero effect on revenues, 
Would I now press the green button to support the motion of OTPA and in agreement with the 15 to 5 committee vote on this bill? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion before us is the auto pass motion on the amendment. The amendment is 1218H. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present are opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay the vote. 282 voting yay, 86 voting nay. The amendment passes. The motion before us now is ought to pass as amended. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor? Who, who was it? Keller Representative Keller requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is not sufficiently seconded. We are back to the question. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Aye. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Majority of the Committee on Public Works and Highways to which was referred. The House will be in order. An act relative to the state 10 year transportation improvement plan. Having considered the same, report the same with the following amendment. Recommendation of bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Mark McConkie from the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following resolution resolved as inexpedient to legislate. Senator Bill Boyd from the minority of the committee. The majority committee amendment is 0961H, printed in House Record 12, pages 170 through 171. Are you ready for the question on the majority amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the majority committee amendment is adopted. The bill is on second reading, open to further amendment. Senator Boyd offers floor amendment 1269H and recognize and speak to his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, through you, to my esteemed colleagues of the New Hampshire General Court, a rise in support of my floor amendment to House Bill 2024, the state 10-year plan, which seeks to keep Continental Boulevard in the hands of the state. I refer my right honorable colleagues to my minority report and to the minority amendment, which can be found on page 171 of the amendment calendar. Two years ago, I stood here in the well of Representatives Hall making the case as to why the state should retain ownership of Continental Boulevard. And today I return. And those same facts remain as the roads maintenance piece, excuse me, roads maintenance, maintenance price tag gets a little bigger. The town of Merrimack has never owned this road. The, state of the, the state's Department of Transportation built this 2.5 mile stretch of road in 1993 through eminent domain, eminent domain proceedings over the ejections of the town. The prevailing argument made by the DOT at that moment in time that public necessity for the use of private property for this road was needed by the public and the region for greater good. Some 30 years later, Continental Boulevard serves as the primary arterial connection 
from Route 101A to the Effie Everett Turnpike. The road handles over 17,000 vehicles daily as it feeds westbound and eastbound traffic along 101A to exits 10 and 11 on the Effie Everett in Merrimack, away from overburdening exit 7 in Nashua. <clears throat> These traffic volume, volumes also exceed the urban compact section of Daniel Webster Highway in Merrimack. That road handles approximately 15,000 vehicles daily in my town. Now the DOT contends that this stretch of roadway is no longer a public necessity to the state, and it seeks to abdicate its ownership and responsibility from a roadway it richly wanted back in 1993. The town's absorption of this roadway to our town budget will be an additional $500,000 annually with long-term capital costs exceeding $7 million over the next 20 years. Furthermore, the town could be acquiring a roadway from the DOT that is currently scheduled by them for a facelift next year. The town's projected cost for repaving this 2.5 mile stretch of roadway lands just shy of $2 million, a single cost that exceeds the town's yearly paving budget. As you deliberate this floor amendment, please consider this fact. The state's ab abdication of Continental Boulevard to the town of Merrimack will be a linchpin in how the DOT handles other state roadways in New Hampshire that they don't want to maintain and pay. The mission creep of giving up state roadways for cost efficiencies would begin, and it could happen in your community. Auxiliary roadways like 11A in Guilford and Alton, 12A in Surrey and Alstead, portions of 101A in Milford, and Mastro 114A in Goffstown, to name a few. The list will become endless if we remove the linchpin and vote to approve the transfer of Continental Boulevard to the town of Merrimack. If you agree with me, then please press the green button to approve the floor amendment and ensure that DOT remains committed and engaged to maintaining the roads and the highways it has been entrusted to oversee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I ask for a division vote. Does the member yield to questions? Absolutely. Member yields, Representative McHugh, you may inquire. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Boyd, for taking my question. So if I understand correctly, if we support this floor amendment, we'll prevent the unfunded mandate to Merrimack and we'll stop the dangerous precedent that could happen to any town. Thank you for the question, Representative McHugh, and that's correct. Uh, it would stop the unfunded mandate um, that is uh, elucidated in Part 1, Article 28 of our Constitution, where the state shall not mandate or assign any new responsibilities to any political subdivisions in such a way as to necessitate additional local expenditures. For what reason do the member rise? Oh. I'd like to ask a question of the representative. Does the member yield to a further question? I yield. You may inquire. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative, thank you for taking my question. This is regarding the DOT construction on Route 101A at Penetuck Square. Would you believe that if the state didn't think that Continental Boulevard had a regional impact to traffic flows along Route 101A, then they wouldn't be proposing to widen that stretch of roadway there, a project that is currently underway? I thank the gentle lady for the question, and yes, I would believe, because I know that the DOT met with the town of Merrimack last week to discuss the prospects of the construction in Penichuk Square, a construction project that has been in the 10-year plan previously to the tune of $5 million, and includes widening, sewer, amongst other amenities to improve that particular roadway. Chair, recognize Representative Rung. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to my esteemed colleague from Merrimack for bringing forth this floor amendment. For years, misinformation has infiltrated the debate about Merrimack tolls and now about Continental Boulevard, which has led to some bad decisions. Handing over ownership of Continental Boulevard to Merrimack from the state would be a bad decision. So allow me to set the record straight. 
decades ago, against the wishes of the town of Merrimack, which you've heard, the state built Continental Boulevard to connect 101A and the Everett Turnpike, both state roads. It was so important to the state to have this connection that they took many properties by eminent domain and cut through school district property, leaving the Thornton's Elementary School on one side of the road and what could have been playing fields for the school on the other. Their, their oversalting of this road caused the contamination of public well that forced our water municipality to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to replace. Now, after all this cost that Merrimack has had to absorb and lost property tax revenues from the eminent domain, the state wants our property taxpayers to make up for their lost revenue. Also decades ago, the town agreed to a toll on exit 11 to pay for the construction of a ramp to serve the Digital Equipment Corporation campus, which is now Fidelity Investments. That toll was to remain up until the bond, the construction bond for the ramp was paid for. However, DOT has refinanced that bond at least twice for other purposes, even though the actual ramp construction costs were paid many years ago. So it was only fair for that toll to come down. So let's look at the majority report that is on page 35 of, today, of this week's calendar. It states, over the past several years, due to the decrease in traffic volume and the elimination of toll plazas, turnpike revenue has declined considerably. Based on declining turnpike revenues and other historical reasons, the majority committee amendment calls for the transfer of ownership of Continental Boulevard to the town of Merrimack. Why should local property taxpayers shoulder the cost of declining turnpike revenue. Turnpikes, by definition, are paid for by users. However, the first third of the Everett Turnpike and the most traveled section is from the Massachusetts state line to exit eight. This stretch has never had a toll despite an earlier 10-year transportation plan that called for one, along with extensive improvements which were, which were already completed. So new ramps, road widening, a bridge to connect to the bridge that goes to Hudson, and toll infrastructure was constructed. If this toll station was put into operation as was planned in that 10-year transportation study, that revenue would be more than enough to cover the turnpike costs. But the users of that stretch of turnpike have paid nothing, zero zilch nada. It is so unfair to have one town pay so the majority of users on a turnpike don't have to. Please vote green to pass this amendment. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative McConkie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and esteemed colleagues. While you are not accustomed to seeing the chair of public works and highways in the well, there's a very good reason for that. In our committee, there is not a partisan bone in our collective body. We work together, reason among ourselves, and nearly always reach a unanimous decision that results with our bills on the consent bill. Public Works and Highways has two charges. On the even years, we bring forward the 10-year transportation plan and on the odd year, we provide the state capital budget. Before you today is House Bill 2024, and the only point of contention is Floor Amendment 1269 to stop the reclassification of Continental Boulevard in the town of Merrimack from becoming a town-maintained road. To defend the committee's position, I will offer a bit of background for your consideration. 
While the Turnpike system receives limited federal funds, it is primarily funded through the toll revenue. Nearly 30 years ago, the town of Merrimack requested the Turnpike to construct ramps to provide access for its citizens to the Turnpike system to alleviate traffic on Route 3 and to enable development in the areas surrounding the ramps. The Turnpike system did not have adequate funds to construct the access in order to advance the projects, Merrimack agreed that the ramps would be tolled. Continental Boulevard was constructed as part of Exit 10 interchange to support major developments in the area and provide construction to both Exit 10 Industrial Drive and Exit 11 via Continental Boulevard. Both Exit 10 and 11 were tolled. But over time, the town advocated for the removal of tolls from exit 10, 11, and 12, resulting in a loss of nearly $1.6 million a year in revenue, and it cost the turnpike when they were removed $2.2 million to remove those tolls. Insult to injury, Continental Boulevard is not even connected to the turnpike but cost the Turnpike $96,000 annually to maintain Continental Boulevard that only benefits Merrimack. The Turnpike cannot afford this expense without, without offsetting revenue. The overwhelming majority of our Public Works and Highways Committee, 18 to 1, supports House Bill 2024 as amended without the Boyd Floor Amendment 1269. I ask that you support our committee position, oppose this amendment, and press the red, be red button when the speaker calls for the vote. Thank you. The motion before us is the Boyd Floor Amendment 1269H. Are you ready for the question? Did I hear a division? This will be a division vote. Members, take your seats. The House will be in order. The motion before us is the Boyd Floor Amendment 1269H. This is going to be a division vote. Chair recognizes Senator Murphy to do a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the Department of Transportation seeks to make up for a deep, a drop in toll revenue by reclassifying Continental Boulevard and dumping ownership, obligation, and responsibility onto the town of Merrimack, and if I know 
that the committee amendment violates the Constitution Bill of Rights, Article 28A, creating the mother of all unfunded mandates that will unjustly increase property taxes for Merrimack residents who will become responsible for maintenance costs such as the $1.8 million anticipated cost for repaving this road, a sum that will exceed the entire paving budget for the town. And finally, if I know that the New Hampshire municipalities like mine, and potentially yours at some point in the future, should not be mandated to take on DOT responsibilities for state-owned roads that the town never wanted or owned in the first place, that when I now press the green button to support adoption of this bipartisan amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair, recognize your Representative McConkie for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know the New Hampshire Turnpike constructed ramps at exits 10, 11, and 12 for the Everett Turnpike, improved and extended an existing town road known as Camp Sergeant, creating Continental Boulevard that relieved traffic on Route 3 and enabled economic development in those areas surrounding those ramps for the sole benefit of Merrimack. If I know the New Hampshire Turnpike only took on the major investment with the express understanding the town of Merrimack would permit tolls to be collected for those aforementioned ramps, to pay for the construction and the continued maintenance. And if I know that Merrimack later actively pursued and secured removal of the Merrimack tolls, triggering a $1.6 million annual loss of tolls, and the removal of those tolls locations cost the Turnpike $2.1 million. And after all that, the Turnpike is left with an expense of $96,000 annual to maintain Continental Boulevard. As mentioned, a local road that is not connected to the, to the New Hampshire Turnpike system. Finally, if you are not from Merrimack, and believe, as I, the town of Merrimack, should have fully considered the financial ramification for their town before they removed a stable revenue stream that would have fully funded the continued maintenance of their local road, would you now join me and press the red button to defeat this amendment? Thank you. The motion before us is the Boyd Floor, Boyd Floor Amendment 1269H. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Okay, there was a slight malfunction, so we are going to do this again. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. The House will be in order.
If all members present have an opportunity to vote, House will tend to stay to the vote. 172 voting yay, 195 voting nay. The amendment fails. We're back to the majority committee motion of auto pass as amended on House Bill 2024. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it. And the committee amendment is adopted. For what reason does a member rise? A motion to print the remarks regarding HB 1607 in the permanent journal. Without objection. For what reason does a member rise? I uh, move that the remarks from uh, House Bill 2024 be placed in the Permanent Journal. Without objection. The Committee on Resources, Recreation, and Development to which was referred House Bill 113, an act relative to shoreline septic systems. Having considered the same report, same with the following amendment, recommendation the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Rosemary Rung for the Committee. The amendment is 1077H, printed in House Record 12, pages 111 to 112. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. No. The ayes have it, and the committee amendment is adopted. Representative Harp, this on bills on second reading, open to further amendment. Representative Harp, our puts floor amendment 1302H, and is recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's in I'm your seat pockets. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm here to ask for your support of uh, the floor amendment that I present on behalf of myself and fellow representative and committee member from Merrimack. Uh, at the committee meeting, after we voted unanimously to pass the amendment you just voted on, the Department of Environmental Services asked us uh, to reconsider and to consider a floor amendment. They had suggested to the committee that they did not reach out to all the interested parties uh, before they met with us with their suggestions. So post our meeting and before today, uh, my fellow representative and I work with the Department of Environmental Services to make this amendment. There's basically three changes in the amendment. The time period for which a seller can give you their evaluation was reduced from three years to 180 days or roughly six months. The time which the buyer needs to replace a failed system was reduced from one year to 180 days or they say six months. I'm told that is consistent with a normal septic failure replacement time period. So we're trying to be consistent with the DEP regulations. So that was amended. And the time period of which a failed system under Section 6 uh, needs to be replaced, that went from one year to 180 days. It was suggested to us that, again, be consistent with the 180-day period. But there's also, as you'll note, we remained the six-month extension in Section 7. Um, so those are the basic changes. They were supported uh, bipartisan with the committee members and also by the uh, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. So I would ask for your support of this amendment. Thank you. Motion before us, the hard floor amendment, 1302H. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. No. The ayes have it, and the floor amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is on pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. No. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. Majority of the Committee on Resources, Recreation, Development, to which was referred House Bill 1121, an act relative to creating certain wetlands permit exemptions 
after a natural disaster or flooding event. Having considered the same, report the same with the floor amendment, following amendment, and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator Juliet Harvey Bolia for the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee. Having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following resolution resolved that is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Jessica LaMontagne for the minority of the committee. The amendment is 1102H, printed in House Record 12, pages 112. You ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the committee amendment is adopted. The motion before us now is on to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the committee amendment is adopted. The Committee on Resources, Recreation, and Development to which was referred House Bill 1301 relative to wake surfing on public bodies of water comes without recommendation. Representative Darby moves ought to pass. For what reason does the member rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to table HB 1301. A motion, there is a motion to table 1301. A division has been, recall, has been called. Members, take your seats. The motion, the motion before us is the um, tabling motion on House Bill 1301. This is uh, going to be a uh, division vote, and the chair recognizes Representative Renzullo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this bill allows just 25 people, not necessarily lakefront owners, to petition the Department of Safety to keep certain types of people and vessels off of their water, and if I know that the Department of Safety said that they do not have the resources to do this at all without fund, extra funding, then would I keep it clean and hit the green? Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Darby for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I knew wake surfing can be an enjoyable sport for young and old, but large wakes in shallow, sensitive areas of a lake can flood loon nests, encourage toxic cyanobacteria blooms, and cause shoreline property damage. And Mr. Speaker, if I knew the amended bill was not a ban on wake surfing, and it does not add broad restrictions, but instead creates a process for the Department of Safety to hold hearings with existing staff to protect these sensitive areas as it does, as it currently does for speed limit restrictions, 
And finally, Mr. Speaker, if I knew the Department of Safety must balance the right to public access to lakes with safety concerns for people and property, as well as environmental and habitat impact, would I now press the red button to oppose the table motion so we can move on to the debate about protecting New Hampshire's magnificent lakes? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1301. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you will press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Sykes and Bayou. If all members present have an opportunity to vote, House will tend to stay the vote. 196 voting nay, 172 voting nay. HB 1301 is laid on the table. Majority of the Committee on Resources, Recreation, and Development to which was referred House Bill 1390, an act relative to regulating wake boating and wake sports. Considered the same, report the same with the following amendment, and the recommendation the bill ought to pass with amendment. Representative Susan Vale for the majority of the committee. Minority of the committee, having considered the same, being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following resolution resolved that is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Robert Hart for the minority of the committee. For what reason does a member rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to table HB 1390. That is a tabling is an in order motion. This will be a division vote. Members, take your seats. This will be a division vote. Excuse me, Mr. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1390. This is a to, to We've already put the question forward. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1390. This will be a division vote. The chair recognizes Representative Renzullo for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this bill is another bill that seeks to unfairly single out wake sports and wake boats for restrictions and bans on public, public bodies of water, and if I know that, the, again, the Department of Safety doesn't have the resources in terms of staff or technology to carry out this bill, then, then 
Would I make the scene and press the green? Chair recognized Representative Tanner for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know our lakes are irreplaceable natural resources and we want to keep them clean and safe, and if I know these regulations will allow for all boaters and those recreating on our lakes to use them safely and responsibly, and if I know people will still be able to enjoy wake surfing, and if I know these regulations will help keep our lakes, shoreline, and wildlife habitat safe and healthy for future generations, would I now vote red against the tabling motion and let the debate begin? Thank you. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1390. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, the House will tend to stay to the vote. 190 voting nay, 178 voting nay. House Bill 1390 is laid on the table. The majority of the Committee on Spe Special Committee on Housing, which was referred House Bill 1291, an act relative to accessory dwelling unit uses allowed by right. Having considered the same report, the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment, Representative Allen Reed for the majority of the committee. The minority of the committee having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority report with the following resolution, resolved that it is inexpedient to legislate Representative Thomas Walsh for the minority of the committee. The amendment is 1203H, printed in House Record 12, on pages 136 to 137. Questions on the adoption of the amendment? You ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay? Aye. The ayes have it, and the amendment's adopted. Now we're on to the main motion of now we're on to, for what reason does a member rise? For a motion, Mr. Speaker. State your motion. I'd like to lay HB 1291 on the table and request a division vote. Representative Phillips requests a roll call. It's sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats.
The question is whether to lay House Bill 1291 on the table. And this is a division vote. House will be in order. Members, find your seats. Representative Walsh is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that this is a top-down zoning change mandated by the state, if I also know that all towns are different and one-size-fits-all solutions never work, therefore these, these th therefore these things should be decided at the local level. If I know this bill expands our current ADU statute by forcing towns to allow a second detached unit, formerly called houses, uh, with a minimum of 1,000 square feet on any single family lot over half an acre, which potentially converts single family lots into three unit rental properties. Mr. Speaker, finally, if I know that simple corrections to our current law, our current ADU law, without the expansion, would, probably would have come out of committee on consent. Wouldn't I then press the green button? Representative Osborne is recognized for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the Special Committee on Housing was created with a diverse group of our members to uh, study and propose solutions to the housing issues that are of concern to our constituents, would I now press the red button and listen to hear what they have brought for us today? The question is whether to lay House Bill 1291 on the table. This is a roll call vote. If you are in, what? Okay. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend to the state of the vote. 87 in the affirmative, 277 in the negative, tabling fails. Representative Sody declared a conflict and Representative Sody declared a conflict and did not participate. Now we are on, we are on the motion of ought to pass as amended. Representative Speer is recognized to speak against the committee report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill removes the local control of planning boards to allocate resources based on the needs of the communities in which they serve. And for that reason, I'm against the bill. Ward 3, which is the ward that I represent, is part of the inner city of Nashua with the largest area of highest density housing units in, this, in the community in all of Nashua. The full inner city consists of the south two-thirds of Ward 3, eastern portions of Ward 2, 4, and 6, and the northern portion of Ward 7. The inner city contains 30% of the 300 miles of the Nashua's sewer lines. The sewer lines in this inner city area combine waste and runoff. In other words, storm drains. They're not separate. Into a single pipe. All the rest of Nashua have these separate. 
Manchester is currently going through a 20-year, $335 million project to separate these lines. The reason this is being done is because in 2005, the EPA filed against Nashua and Manchester for polluting the Merrimack River. We have not cleared that yet. If you've read in the news, you would see that we have dumped 20 million gallons of, wa of wastewater into the Merrimack from Nashua and 875 million gallons of combined wastewater from Manchester. That's over three times the amount at which we were fined in the first place for polluting the river. So we've exceeded all expectations for being able to pollute. And that's just last year, and it rained today. Nashua River wasn't even included in the 20 million gallons. We have nine, now what, when hap when, what happens with uh, combined uh, sewer pipes is they reach something called a CSO, in other words, a combined sewer overflow point. That's the point at which it cannot no longer siphon all of it down into the um, treatment plants. And so it just gets dumped out into the river. I'm not going to take your time explaining that, although I did research it a lot, and it's really cool. And there are some benefits to that combination, but we far exceeded the ability to be able to handle that anymore. So the problem we now have as a result of the 2005 finding is that we have to fix this. We've been mandated to fix it. The state of New Hampshire has not spent any money on this. The town's taxes have to pay for it. Manchester, as I indicated, have to pay $335 million. Since it's a 25-year project, it's 20-year project, it's probably going to overrun, and that's the way life is. Nashua was told that in order to fix what was left of the third, as I said, that we had 300 miles of sewer, there was only 10%, uh, 30% of that is in and in the area called the inner city. It was going to cost another $225 million to separate those pipes into wastewater and runoff. Nashua said they couldn't afford it. They just didn't have the money, so they came up with another plan. The plan in Nashua to handle this, and it will get fixed over the next 10 years. It hasn't been fixed yet because we're still dumping. The plan over the next 10 years is the inner city portion keeps the pipes together. We will never separate them out. But the portion that's in the rest of Nashua, they're fine, and they, have, and, and they work well with the, ver the upgraded and ex $69 million Nashua spent uh, a few years back to upgrade the sewer facility, uh, I'm sorry, the upgrade the treatment facility and to put a 40,000 gallon uh, holding tank to be able to hold some of that runoff. But as I said, the runoff is now three, over three times what was ever expected for it to be able to hold. The area that's in the inner city consists of pipes, and you can read it on the map. I'm not making this up, although I was incredibly surprised to find out myself, are made out of clay, they're made out of brick, they're made out of cement, they're fragile, and they're as old as being installed in 1855. The town doesn't want to touch them, because if they do, they're afraid that the whole thing will just fall apart. Although I, that's my reading on it. I mean, I think they don't want to do it because it costs $250 million. The streets in this area are narrow. The kind of excavation equipment you have to get down those streets is probably impossible. As some of Manchester is finding out right now, it's, it's a disaster. But not a disaster that's going to be forever. You know, you move on from each street at a little bit at a time. The idea of all of a sudden letting individuals take it upon themselves to add ADUs in an area that is so fragile and is not in the process, has not completed their, their uh, pollution prevention that has been mandated by the EPA. 
and the fact that the state of New Hampshire is not going to help them do one bit of this. And our taxpayers have to pay between the two cities over a billion dollars to straighten this out. Seems to me we don't need another state mandate. We got enough mandates, we're reeling from under it. One of the other problems we have in Nashua, and I don't know if they have this problem in Manchester, is that our, our supply of water in this inner city area is so old that the best we can get is 18 PSI in this inner city area. 18 PSI is not enough to take a shower. We don't have the ability to operate and just let individuals do this sort of thing. Now, that this bill would let you believe that the town has done nothing for housing. Uh, Nashua has put in over 2,000 housing units in the last two years alone, but they've been able to rate the uh, rate, uh, route the pipes to an area that has split runoff and split sewer. Not Member in the middle of this for a minute. area, the uh, inner city that we're talking about. For a That's okay. You probably couldn't hear me because I can't really hear you, which is shocking considering only about half the members are in here. But please keep it quiet and minimize holding the doors in the back open. Sorry, go ahead. As I said, we don't need another mandate telling us that we have to take on individuals not being, allow being allowed to do what they want with their, with their properties as far as impacting the, the, the sewer system that we all share and that we depend on in this inner city area. Other areas of Nashua, maybe something can be done, maybe it's okay, but we need to plan because this area is so fragile that we don't have much that, we don't have, until they fix the rest of the uh, dumping problem, we're just gonna keep getting fined by the EPA. And as I say, the state isn't helping with that. Also, I said, mentioned that the water system we have, every time new houses are put on this water system, our pressure goes down. We just don't have the facility in this area. Other areas do. And so other areas could be planned for more housing and could be planned. But as I say, Nashua has put in over 2,000 new housing units. And they've done it by routing the water and the, and the uh, sewer from another area, not from inside of our inner city area. This is all part of planning. This is, what, this is the way what planners do. We can't take that away from them. And so I'm asking you to ITL this, uh, this bill, and I would ask for a division vote. Representative Turkos recognized to speak against the report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to start out by saying one thing, dispelling a misconception out there that this is something about, this bill is something about property rights. The only people's property rights are who are going to be negatively affected are those who are going to be affected by the mandates that the state is handing down. This is zoning by the state. This is not property rights. If you want to talk about giving property rights back to the people, I've got a great solution. Let's put forth a, 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 a bill that actually just eliminates all zoning. Take care of it. You get your property rights back. I don't think there have been... Too many people are going to be going along with that. The current RSAs allow the municipality to make zoning changes with the warrant and article process. That is local control. That is what the municipal and county government committee consistently applies when we talk about zoning. And the NHMA strongly endorses that concept of local control. So what does this bill attempt to force on the municipalities? Allows two ADUs now. It used to be one, now you're gonna have two. One attached, one unattached. It increases the size of the first one. Hey, you got a garage? Make it an, e an ADU. Have a space above a garage? Convert that to a second ADU. Have, some extra, have a big shed in the backyard? Hey, do a little work on that and convert that to an ADU. 
Now, according to the la- some of the language in there also, it says, the second ADU shall be required to meet the definition of workforce housing and shall be required to meet the definition of affordable as defined in the RSAs. We just killed a bill here a couple weeks ago regarding rent control. On the smaller lots, a primary residence, your two ADUs could potentially take up nearly every square foot of that property. So where are the cars going to park? Well, this language takes care of that. And this is what it says. At a legally dedicated off-site location at the property owner's discretion. So where is that going to be? Is it going to be a block away, two blocks away, half mile away, a mile away? Or is it more likely going to be the result that the renters of the ADUs start parking on and clogging up the seats, uh, streets near the units? You're going to have negative aesthetic and social effects on the neighborhoods. There's no way to get around it. Let's say you bought in a neighborhood consisting of family homes like my uh, mom grew up in in the north end of Manchester. When you buy a piece of property, you have an expectation of the zoning when you buy. And you expect that zoning to remain and not be negated by the state. And with this, you're going to have no input on it. When the state mandates it down, it's not the Warren article process, so you're not going to have a vote in that process. The previous speaker mentioned the demands on the municipal uh, water and sewer infrastructure. Who's going to pay for that? What about, will the rapid increase in the newcomers require increased police, EMT presence, increased trash collection? What is the increased cost to the taxpayers? How many new school-age kids will be enrolling who are living in the ADUs who have one or, more two, one or two or more children living on the property? Does an extra $1,000 collected in taxes cover the additional $20,000 per student? No, it doesn't. So again, I'll ask, what will be the cost to the taxpayers? Now, I'm going to go off a little bit here and talk about process. I want to talk about the Special Committee on Housing. That's a 10-member committee. This bill before you right here, nine of the 10 committee members were sponsors of this bill. This committee heard this bill, had the hearing, exact it, and then sent it to the floor on a vote of 9 to 1. Does anybody see anything a little off with that? I sure do. Men will suspend. Yes. M- motives are off limits. The what? Motives are off limits. Okay. These bills belong in municipal and county government where the subject matter experts reside. And I can tell you. Member will suspend. The speaker assigns the bills. He put them where they were appropriate. Correct. All right, we'll move on to the wrap-up. How's that? So again, let's talk that these ADU structures would be a mandate and take away the local control. Don't be misled by the language. The sounder softing language that these bills, a lot of these bills contain, allowed by a matter of right? No. To be clear, this means your municipalities must allow the two ADUs in this case. It's not an option. Politicians in Concord do not understand and know the needs and wants of distant municipalities such as Pittsburgh or Hampton or Lebanon or Nashua or my town of Barrington. To believe we know better is simply wrong don't infringe on the municipality's role of zoning. And I'm going to end with an axiom that we used to say at the Allied Pilots Association, where the member of Kingston used to also be a member. While I was in leadership there, a member of a 
pilot union during my leadership roles, whenever we were in contract negotiation times, we used to have a saying. And the saying was, a good contract sells itself. No sales job to the members is required. That axiom applies to legislation also. I'll ask that you support the, uh, that you oppose the motion, uh, the motion of ought to pass, so another motion can be made. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Alexander is recognized to speak in support of the committee report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to dispel a bunch of the narratives that's being pushed off today. Um, I, but first, I want to thank you for forming, not you in particular, but the speaker um, behind you, for forming the Special Committee on Housing, because out of these bills, there's only two on the regular calendar, five are on consent. We got some really good stuff done regarding ta small targeted changes at the approval processes and unnecessary codes. This bill came into place because of a law that was signed allowing ADU by right in SB 146 in 2016. Since then, municipalities have gone around this law by putting in arbitrary parking mandates, setback requirements, in order to restrict property owners from building ADUs on their own land. Now, I believe unless there is a health or safety issue, you should not have a right to tell someone what they can and cannot do with their own property. This bill is a clarifying bill that makes it clear that municipalities cannot restrict an ADU by right by changing the definition of attached versus detached and allowing one ADU to be detached, but the second one has to be attached. It also makes it clear that a municipality cannot say you must have five or six parking spaces. That seems a little ridiculous for an ADU that's 1,000 square feet. You need six parking spaces. This is how municipalities zone out this types of building and it's wrong in my opinion. But under HB 1291, local governments still have the ability to do all these things. Ready, I'm gonna list them off. It, they have the right to restrict it if it lacks sufficient space. Because the setback requirements, a private well, a wetland, or the property line are not adequate. If it lacks sufficient land to construct an adequate septic system, they can deny it based on science, based on health, based on safety. If it lacks drinkable water, you can deny it if it lacks adequate parking, if it lacks adequate fire protection. Municipalities may also require that the owner occupies one of the units. That means that they're, I don't know, like people know the people that are living in that property. This bill is the gentlest way possible to increase the housing supply for this state. New Hampshire voters have indicated that housing availability is the number one issue affecting them. We have generations of Granite Staters looking for their retirement home, first home, and dream home, and lack, the lack of supply has led to stagnation in the market. No one is moving. Let's give property owners the right to build on their own property. Join me, vote green. Thank you. The question is on the motion of us passed as amended on House Bill 1291. Representative Granger has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? That is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats.
Questions on the motion about to pass on House Bill 1291. Representative Walsh is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I still know, this is a top-down, one-size-fits-all state mandate. If I also know that these decisions are best done in our local towns, they have the knowledge of the towns. And finally, Mr. Speaker, if I know that my voting no on this ought to pass, I'll be able to go back to my town and look at the citizens in the eye and say I voted for your decision, then wouldn't I press the green button? Red. That's why we ask. Representative Baruti is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that we are in the midst of a severe housing shortage and a record high rental market with thousands of new units needed, and Mr. Speaker, if I know that House Bill 1291 is a step in the right direction to allow property owners to build additional units, ADUs, to allow young adults and an aging population on a fixed income who cannot afford the high rent, along with disabled people who cannot find or afford safe housing. And now, Mr. Speaker, we know that um, uh, these units can uh, also cause uh, potential home buyers to qualify for a mortgage. And finally, Mr. Speaker, House Bill 1291 has a blessing of many people across the state and groups who came to our committee, such as New Hampshire Housing Finance, the Realtors, and the Disabled Community, to only name a few. Now, Mr. Speaker, should I now press the green button and take a giant step towards to face this housing crisis head on? Thank you. The question is on the motion of ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1291. There's a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? House will attend to the state of the vote. 220 in the affirmative, 143 in the negative. And with Representative Sodi declaring a conflict and not participating, the motion is adopted. The majority of the Special Committee on Housing, to which was referred House Bill 1399, an act allowing municipalities to permit two residential units in certain single family residential zones. Having considered the same report, the same with the following amendment and the recommendation that the bill ought to pass with amendment, Representative Josh Keller from the majority of the committee. The minority of the committee, having considered the same and being unable to agree with the majority, report with the following resolution resolved that it is inexpedient to legislate. Representative Thomas Walsh for the minority of the committee. The amendment is 1157H, printed on House Record 12 on pages 148 to 149. The question is on the adoption of the amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. Aye. The ayes have it and the amendment's adopted. Now we're on the main motion of ought to pass as amended. Representative Len Turcotte is recognized to speak against the committee report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I rise in opposition to House Bill 1399. 
This bill requires that on all lots of two acres or less and at least 50% of single family zone lots, duplexes shall be allowed again by right. Based on the section of the proposed RSA, a two unit residence would be permitted on property zoned industrial, commercial, agricultural, historic district, any property of two acres or less, and the municipality must accept it. It cannot be denied. This bill has an interesting clause exception that deals with water and sewer. We know that adding up to the additional 50%, up to an additional 50% of res residential units in a city will definitely increase the demands on the water and sewer line. This bill states, you have 10 years to upgrade your water system, and if you don't, well, we can build it anyway, by right. I think we'd all agree that the state compelling zoning changes and forcing a city to redo their water and sewer without providing funding is therefore an unfunded mandate. The municipalities planners are going to have to develop some extraordinary powers of ESP on this one, as it would require the municipality to be able to predict all future proposed development. Once it does that, then it has to determine what proposed development meets two, alt uh, two alteration or demolition criteria, and then attempt to predict and allocate between the two acres or less lots and 50% of residential lots. Confused yet? I've gone over this thing multiple, multiple times, and I still am confused by this one. Just imagine being one of the planning uh, or the uh, individuals in your town who has to figure this one out and implement it. Once the municipality calculates how many of the two acres are less qualified, then it must divide out those zoned for single-family homes and then determine whether that is 50% of all single-family lots. If it is less, presumably the municipality must go back and again predict all future proposed development and then allow duplexes and at least half that qualify under the two conditions. Crystal clear now? Nothing like a huge case of mathematical gymnastics. Continuing this language in the bill is therefore would require instances where single lots qualify, are qualified but none around it do, creating what is known as spot zoning. The court case of Boss versus Portsmouth heard decades ago, spot zoning was adjudicated as illegal. An important line from that case the adjoining property owners in the district are entitled to rely on the rule that a classification once made will not be changed unless the change is required for the public good. In other words, the state should not be forcing mandates onto towns and cities taking away the property rights of the municipality's current residents. Is there even a remote possibility that the <laughs> scenario where the municipality is going to be able to figure out even how to comply with this legislation. The legislation has been poorly drafted and it is inadequate, uh, has inadequately been analyzed for its practical application. I'll say once again that local control of zoning is a long-standing practice that gives the municipalities and its citizens the ability to change zoning if they determine by Warren article. Top-down zoning changes by the state couched as getting back property rights is misleading. You do not force many people to accept the will of a few politicians or bureaucrats that is central planning at its worst. I ask you to oppose the motion of OTPA so another uh, motion can be made. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the member yield for a question? Why not? Representative Comstock, you may inquire. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for taking my question. Um, I live in a town where we have a two-acre minimum lot size, um, and we also have controlled growth. How will this affect us? I missed the last part. Say it again. Um, we also have controlled growth, um, where we allow so many building permits per year. How will this affect our town? That's an excellent question. I don't have the answer t for you because, as I said, the way this is drafted already, it's a, a mathematical improbability. Does the member yield for further questions? Sure. Representative Cahill, you may inquire. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Do you believe that the proper place for this bill was in front of the Municipal and County Government Committee? That's not a, not a proper question. I can't answer that, but yes. Thank you. <laughs> Representative McWilliams is recognized to speak for the committee report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> House Bill 1399 aims to address our chronic shortage of missing middle housing by enabling homeowners to expand existing single family homes into duplexes or build new duplex homes on smaller lots in single family residential zones. This increases housing options and provides more units to address New Hampshire's housing shortage crisis. This bill allows duplexes to be built in 50% of single family residential zones and lots of two acres or less in size by right, provided that new duplex does meet certain criteria. Duplexes are light density, and from the street, they are often the same size and appearance as a single family house. You can't even tell it's a duplex. We can no longer wait for local control to fix the problem of overly restrictive local zoning ordinances. Down zoning, when a parcel of land is rezoned, from a prior more intense use to more restricted use is what we're dealing with right here, right now. Local control will not fix the problem of historical downzoning, which is why this bill is needed to restore duplexes our missing middle housing. Duplexes do not devalue property in impacted zones. Duplexes do not force municipalities to increase sewer and water capacity. In fact, we have two special clauses in the bill to address concerns about sewer and water issues. And finally, there's the concern that if there's a public health and safety issue, you may ask the state for a finding to find your way around not allowing duplexes. So there is an out. Finally, in terms of impact on local planning boards, Local planning boards can still impose objective zoning limitations even with this bill. Height limitations, building setbacks, allowable lot coverage, and of course, our historic and other overlay districts still apply. So in conclusion, I ask you to please support this bill so that we can bring back missing middle housing that we had 50 years ago until it was downzoned by our local ordinances. Thank you. The question's on the... Majority committee report about to pass as amended. Representative Granger requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? That is sufficiently seconded. It'll be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. Questions on the Majority Committee report about to pass as amended on House Bill 1399. This is a roll call vote. Representative Walsh is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if I know this is another top-down zoning change mandated by the state. Uh, and, it, it, and if I know, I, uh, this one's a little different because I really don't have a problem with duplexes. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, if I know the problem is with how the bill is written, uh, demolition requirements and percentages, percentages of lots and residential lots versus residential lots, the need to estimate future growth to maintain the 50 percent that's required with the very real chance of spot zoning, which, as you heard, is illegal. <clears throat> uh, if I also know, Mr. Speaker, that I don't want you to take my word for it, uh, but an attorney from the New Hampshire Municipal Association sent out uh, a communication stating, quote, due to the complexity of mathematics here, I simply do not see any scenario where any municipality in the state would be able to comply with this legislation, unquote. Mr. Speaker, finally, if I know this is a mandate that doesn't work and we should do better to pass laws, 
Ooh, I then press the red button. Representative Damon's recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that duplexes are cost-effective, missing middle housing, but they've been difficult to build due to local zoning restrictions, and if I know this bill includes solid protections for municipalities to apply objective standards, as well as permitting an exemption if there is specific adverse effect upon public health and safety, and if I know increasing our housing availability is critical to maintaining a sufficient workforce in New Hampshire, and that this bill passed our bipartisan committee by a nine to one vote, would I now press the green button to facilitate creating desperately needed housing? Thank you. Questions on the majority committee report about to pass as amended, House Bill 1399. It's a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Of all members present, had an opportunity to vote. House will attend to the state of the vote. 220 in the affirmative, 140 in the negative. The motion is adopted. Representative Sodi declared a conflict and did not participate. The Committee on State, Federal Relations, and Veterans Affairs to which is referred House Resolution 31, an act urging support of the Dignity Through Prosperity Act. Having considered the same, report the same with the recommendation that the bill be referred for interim study. Representative Michael Moffitt for the committee. For what reason does the member rise? I'd like to make a motion, please. State your motion. I'd like to table this bill, please. The motion is to table. House Resolution 31. You ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay? Aye. The ayes have it, and it's laid on the table. For what reason does the member rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, to make a motion. State your motion. I'd like to um, uh, remove House Bill 546 from the table. Representative Luno moves to pull House Bill 546 off the table. Well, the motion is going to be to remove House Bill 546 from the table. And a division vote. Representative Sweeney requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? That is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. So members take your seats. The question is whether to remove House Bill 546 from the table. Representative Luno is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
If I know that House Bill 546 has passed this chamber before and that it offers a responsible increase to school building aid and provides some relief to projects and taxpayers that have been hung up for more than a decade uh, during the moratorium, then would I press the green button to support this motion? Thank you very much. Representative Sweeney is recognized for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the sky is almost dark, and Mr. Speaker, if I know that we tabled this bill back in January, we've had a number of great bipartisan wins today that we can roll through the rest of the calendar, uh, would I now press the red button to keep this on the table where it's been since January? Thank you. The question is whether to remove House Bill 546 from the table. It's a roll call vote. If you are in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? The House will attend the state of the vote. 182 in the affirmative, 179 in the negative, 546 is removed from the table. Representative Kate Murray moves ought to pass on House Bill 546 and requests a division vote. Members, take your seats. Representative Sweeney requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently? Yep. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. For what reason does a member rise? Question of the chair. Yep. This bill has a, a uh, fiscal note attached to it. Have we passed the deadline for dealing with both uh, bills going to a second committee? The committee was fine. Uh, the bill was in finance, so that's not a problem. Thank you. The motion is on to pass in House Bill 546. Representative Murray is recognized for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that we are woefully behind in our responsibility to provide clean, safe, and modern schools for our children in New Hampshire, and if I know before us we have an excellent opportunity to provide additional support for school building aid beyond what was provided in the budget, and that this is both a fiscally responsible move as well as a governmentally and civically responsible move. If I know that even if we are still behind in building aid, this additional funding will provide great help to several more schools and will put us on a better path towards addressing the school building issues that we face. And lastly, if I know that this will not only benefit our students, but will also have a positive impact on our future workforce. Would I now press the green button to support the out to pass motion? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The questions on the motion of out to pass in House Bill 546. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
of all members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will attend to the state of the vote. 182 in the affirmative, 178 in the negative. The motion is adopted. The Committee on Transportation, to which was referred House Bill 1273 FN, an act relative to the protection of personal information in driver's licenses. Having considered the same, report the same with the recommendation that the bill be referred for interim study. Representative Ted Gorski for the committee. The question is on the motion of interim study. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. I also now attend to bills removed from the consent calendar. For what reason does a member rise? Mr. Speaker, having voted um, on the prevailing side on House Bill 546, I move reconsideration and urge the membership to vote no. Representative Weber moves reconsideration on House Bill 546 and requests a division vote. Members, take your seats. The motion is reconsideration on House Bill 546. Members should be in their seats. If you're in favor, press the green button. Opposed, press the red. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. The House will attend to the state of the vote. 172 in the affirmative, 188 in the negative. Reconsideration fails. The Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety to which was referred House Bill 1711FN, an act authorizing the state to report mental health data for firearms background check purposes, providing for processes for confiscation of firearms following a certain mental health related court proceeding and for relief from mental health related firearms disabilities. If we considered the same, report the same with the following amendment and the recommendation of Bill ought to pass with amendment. Senator David Hughes for the committee. For what reason does the member rise? To make a higher priority motion. S state your motion. I move to table House Bill 1711. That is a proper motion. The motion before us is to table House Bill 1711. A division has been requested. This will be a division vote. Members, take your seats.
The motion before us is to table House Bill 1711. This is a division vote. The chair recognizes Representative Hull for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I'm aware that there are at least two floor amendments on this bill, if I'm aware that it's after 6 o'clock and we're going to be here for a while, and Mr. Speaker, if I know that there are some unintended consequences with the bill as currently drafted that is addressed by one of the floor amendments, would I now vote yes to table this bill? Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Roy for parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Speaker, if I know that Chief Bradley Haas probably wishes he was here at 6 o'clock tonight, would I not table this bill? The motion before us is to table House Bill 1711. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had the opportunity to vote. Household tend to stay to the vote. 150 voting A, 205 voting A. Tabling motion fails. Committee amendment is 0431H, printed in House Record 12, pages 169. Are you ready for the question on the committee amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. Aye. The ayes have it. The committee amendment is adopted. Bills on second reading open to further amendment. Representative Comtois, Office Floor Amendment 1350H. It's in your seat pockets. Chair recognizes Representative Wool. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The amendment that's in your seat pocket relative to this bill takes the bill that we have and turns it into a study committee. It does that for multiple reasons. The amendment that was just adopted by this body includes involuntary admissions. What does that mean? Let's say you have a child who came down with a serious issue, a medical issue of some sort. I'm going to use anorexia because that's clearly a, a potential for self-harm, right, or harm, harm to the person in a significant way. You could have a court rule that that person needs to go to the hospital and stay there until they're in a better position. Is that person a criminal? Is that person dangerous to themselves? Well, they have an eating disorder, but I'm not sure they're dangerous to themselves. When we draft legislation, we should be really clear about the terms. This uses the same broad language that's in current federal statutes. And that broad language doesn't necessarily apply to all the cases in New Hampshire. People that struggle with mental health issues shouldn't be treated as criminals, should not be put on a criminal database. People that have mental health issues should, in fact, get the care that they need. By forcing this bill through, even with the committee amendment, what we're saying is if you have a mental health issue, you're a criminal. On the other side, and I disbelieve that completely, on the other side, we're saying that if you take away their firearms, even when a courtroom has, or court has deemed that they're dangerous, they're suddenly magically safe. Do we really believe that? 
I remember a number of years ago where Timothy McVeigh used diesel fuel and fertilizer to end the lives of over 150 people. I would call him um, a danger to others. Whether he had a prior mental health record is, is not the point I'm arguing. The point I'm arguing right now is he was clearly a threat to others and needed help. And unfortunately, he, he demolished the building. We have a chance to study this issue right now to address the issues and the concerns raised by everybody from the disability rights groups all the way over to the gun groups. This is the time to do that. I would ask that you would adopt the floor amendment 1330H so that we can go on and finish out our evening. Thank you. Chair recognize Representative Roy. Mr. Speaker, don't fall for straw man arguments. This has nothing to do with eating disorders or manure bombs. This has got to do with whether or not someone is dangerous to themselves or others and has had two hearings in court, has had a lawyer assigned to them, and even after that, oh, and excuse me, has also been committed prior to that for 10 days for observation. Even after all that, the court has said, you are likely a danger to yourselves or others. If someone could find me, someone who's had their weapons taken for anorexia, I will give you my next year's salary from here. I don't anticipate I'll be doing that. So let's be serious. This is a serious issue. We don't need to study it. We've been fighting back and forth about this now for over 10 years. And in that time, while we keep doing these little, these little maneuvers, Three police officers have been shot by people who should have been committed and who were committed and should have been on that list, and one of them's dead. So I ask you to not support this uh, amendment to study. Let's get on with it, get to the final vote, and be done. The motion before us is the Comptoir Floor Amendment 1350H. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. Nay! The ayes have it. The nays have it. The nays have it. The nays have it. I wasn't expecting a voice vote. Uh, the nays have it. The floor amendment fails. Bills on second reading open to further amendment. Representative Houle offers floor amendment 1358H. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is the more complex amendment, and, and although it's two pages front and, or whatever, one page front and back. It is exactly what was adopted in the amendment from the committee with two small changes. The first change is in the first couple of paragraphs relative to whether you're a harm to others or just a harm to yourself, or sorry, a harm to yourself or a harm to yourself and others. This carves out those that are potentially a harm to themselves and says those names shouldn't be going into NICS. This was the issue I brought up earlier. Those people, right, are in a different category than those that were ruled or adjudicated as not, reason, not competent to stand trial or were ruled not guilty by reason of insanity or, or were a court has ruled where they're a danger to others. The other part of this amendment is on, the, uh, is on the back relative to what to do about the fact that Officer Haas was standing guard at a metal detector. He was the perimeter security for the state hospital. He was a former police chief. And all the police officers I know carry personally on their own time. So why was the person manning the security booth Manning the metal detector, not carrying a personal firearm that day, when he probably would have been for his personal protection outside of his job that day. That family deserves to know the answers to that question, and it's time to form the study committee to figure out why he was disarmed when he was acting as the security. Officer Haas was still alive when he got to the hospital that day, and while the psychiatric hospital is kind of diagonally across the street from Concord Hospital. They're relatively close. It's, it's, not, it's not 
just a 30 second jaunt between the two. It takes a little bit of time to get between those two buildings. I would argue that his family deserves to know the answers. So this amendment carves out the, simply carves out those who might be a danger to themselves and creates a study committee. Mr. Speaker, I would ask for a roll call vote on the adoption of this amendment. Chair recognize Representative Roy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would ask everyone, take a look at that amendment. Take a look at the end of that amendment. It says, we want to know, we want a study committee to study whether the state of New Hampshire is complicit in the murder of Chief Haas. Think about that. That's what the amendment he's asking you to vote on, to study. Was, it, was the state of New Hampshire complicit in the murder of that man? Because he was alive when he went to work that day, so therefore he was stripped of his firearm. So. Rather than say someone who's been committed to a mental institution because they're a danger to herself or others, we should make it easier for other people to shoot them. That, that's what he's saying. Again, don't fall for it. Let's get to the main issue. Vote no to this amendment. Representative Poole has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? Yep. It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is ought to pass is, is, and the whole floor amendment 1358H. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognize Representative Hull for a parliamentary inquiry. Waves off. Representative Roy waves off. The motion before us is the whole floor amendment 1358H. 8H. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present have the opportunity to vote. House will tend to stay to the vote. 101 voting day, 252 voting nay. Floor amendment failed. Now we're on to ought to pass as amended. Chair recognize Representative Hull. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll make this short. Third time at the well is more than enough. The bill before you has issues. We have a choice in this. Do we pass legislation right now that needs work and hope the other body behind us fixes it? Or do we take the time and delay the passage of this so that at some point in the future, a better version of this bill could be brought forward? I would ask that you would vote no on the auto pass as adopted or amended motion. Thank you. Chair recognize Representative Prout. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wish to focus on the confiscation act of this aspect of this bill. 
This aspect goes beyond any requirement of federal law. These procedures do not address situations that are well known to be quite commonplace, joint ownership of firearms. This can either be by husband and wife or with more extended family via trusts. This is extremely commonplace, especially with higher value and collectible firearms as an estate planning tool and for other reasons. How commonplace, you may wonder? There's lawyers that specialize in creating these firearm trusts and purpose-made tools for creating these trusts from templates. In fact, I'm fairly certain there's a kiosk on the counter of a gun store in my town to create and print a trust just before you're completing your purchase at the next, ca next counter over. Firearms do not have deeds or registered titles like houses or cars. However, this law cannot function without that and will lead to firearm registration. There are firearms within my family that have been passed down from generations that have died and it is totally unclear who owns them. They weren't line item in the will and all the descendants can use them if they want to and it's never really been discussed who owns them. This bill directs the judge to inquire if the person has access to any firearms. It gives no guidance about what the judge should do with that information. Should the court order the owner of the of them to remove access or just confiscate them too. This lack of clarity will cause problems. This bill uh, gives discretion to unelected judges to approve transfers of firearms to non-prohibited individuals, but without any guidance on the factors to be considered when exercising this discretion. This sets up individuals for wildly different treatment depending on which judge they get. Faced with all these uncertainties, it is abundantly clear that what will happen in the practice is the police to seize any and all firearms tangentially related to the individual and let the courts figure it out. If passed, this bill will infringe on the rights of anyone cohabitating with a prohibited person. I have had close family members that have experienced mental health cr crises. I am a gun owner, and they were as well. It was something we had to deal with as part of the situation. Another aspect of that situation was, at one point, they couldn't live alone. And so, as a family, we made a plan. That plan did involve cohabitating. If this bill were law at that time, the option would have been off the table. This bill would have been directed to come from my guns too. It would have been put the burden on me to prove ownership of each item, a burden I'm not confident I could have met. And it's unclear that even if I had, if I would have been allowed to keep them in the same household, I would have been forced to make a choice. That's a terrible thing to do to a family in crisis. It'll make, the men make mental health issues in our society worse, not better. It'll erode the support structures that these people have. It will make them even more of a pariah and close doors to them. It will infringe on the rights of far more people than just those that have been formally adjudicated as outlined in this bill. I urge you to press the red button and vote against this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognize Representative Belcher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hello, colleagues. I won't take long with this. Uh, there are portions of this bill that seem entirely reasonable to me. Unfortunately, there are some parts that I have a little bit more concern about. There's a long history, if we look back on all of the nations in the 20th century of this, of this planet, where authoritarian or totalitarian regimes made a habit of calling their opposition and dissidents insane and using that premise to remove their rights. This happened across every country of the Soviet bloc. This happened in Cuba. This happened in China. It's happened in a lot of places. Now, why would I bring that up? It's not like there's any risk of something like that ever happening here, right? There's no totalitarian or authoritarian or suppressive movements happening in the United States of America, right? Let me read you just one, one statement, one line from the mission statement of the American Psychological Association. The APA is committed to the infusing the principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion into all aspects of the work we do. Thank you. Please vote red. Chair recognize Representative Roy.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, so a couple things. Um, first of all, you may wonder where did where did I get this uh, this language from? Because you know we hear this part's a little problematic, that part's a little problematic. I got this language from the NRA. That's where I got this language from. I got this language from the NRA. I got this language from 48 other states that have this bill. I haven't heard of anybody um, in all these states that have had this for years. Anyone who's been lost their guns because of anorexia. I haven't heard of any, any other issues with regard to the representative's question about confiscation of guns. Um, I worked very closely with NAMI on this issue. I made sure that people had a choice. Their guns are not going to be confiscated and brought to some police locker and thrown in a closet. They, the people have a choice of where they can go. They can transfer them to a friend, relative, an FFL. We went out of our way to make sure that our bill, while complying with the federal statutes, has more freedom than any other states. The person could choose where their firearms go, who gets them. So we, we worked very carefully. Also, the language. I worked with NAMI, I worked with the Attorney General, and I worked with the courts. All of them looked at this language very specifically. It went through 12, 13, maybe more edits before it was just right. And more importantly, what I haven't heard anyone say is there's a restoration of rights process in this bill. Right now, New Hampshire does not have one. You cannot ever in your life get your firearms back if they are listed for a, a mental health thing. Right now, there's over a thousand people on that list from New Hampshire, and more can be added all the time, because this isn't the only way you can get on there. So if you are listed, for example, if you go to your doctor and you tell your doctor, I'm thinking about killing myself, and the doctor believes you, they have to report that to the Department of Safety. Who can report that to NICS right now without this? So there's names on the list right now from New Hampshire for people that cannot buy firearms because of mental health disabilities, and they are banned for the rest of their life because the federal government will not remove anyone's name from that list unless your state has an approved restoration of rights program in law. I put that in this bill. And what's more, not one name from New Hampshire is allowed to go on that list until the restoration of rights program is approved by the ATF. That means if no one's name can go on, get off, no one's name goes on. So we put so many protections in this. There's only so much we can do. I made sure that we are protecting people and are protecting Second Amendment gun owners at the same time, the way such states as Florida and Texas and Alaska have also done. And if you think that they're not pro-gun states, I suggest you need to do a little research. Please support this. Let's get this out and make sure that another tragedy doesn't happen and we don't end up with a real red flag bill. Because we just discussed about what's going to happen when bills get over there. Well, what happens when there's different people over there and in the corner office? Think about that. This is our chance to put our line in the sand that we agree something has to be done, but not take everyone's guns. Thank you. The, most <clears throat> the motion before us is ought to pass on uh, House Bill 1711. There has been a request for a division. Members, Representative Houle requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. <clears throat> The, most, <clears throat> the motion before us ought to pass as amended in House Bill 1711. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
If all members present had an opportunity to vote, the House will attend the state of the vote. 204 voting A, 149 voting A. Committee report is adopted. <clears throat> Committee on Transportation, to which was referred House Bill 1637, an act relative to reducing requirements for vehicle inspections. Having considered the same report, the same with the following amendment, and the recommendation of the bill ought to pass with amendment. Mr. John Sellers for the committee. Committee amendment is 1222H, printed in House Record 12, pages 166 through 168. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the committee amendment is adopted. Those, those on second reading open to further amendment. Representative, Representative, Representative Sykes, office floor amendment 1305H, and is recognized to speak to his amendment. Thank you, colleagues. This is just a, the, the floor amendment before you just adopts all the language we just approved as amended and is just fixing a drafting error and by adding the following language, show evidence, uh, part three, section B, show evidence of pitting on 50% or more of the friction surface. Uh, this was a language that uh, the, the, the ranking member, myself, the chair of the committee and, and others were uh, in agreement with, so I would appreciate your support. The motion before us is the Sykes Floor Amendment. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those nay. The ayes have it, and the <coughs> amendment is adopted. The motion now before us is ought to pass with amendment. Are you ready for the? A division has been requested. This will be a division vote. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1637. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present have the opportunity to vote. House will attend to stay the vote. All members present have the opportunity to vote. The vote. <clears throat> Motion passes 349 to 6.
For what reason does a member rise? For a motion. State your motion. I would like to remove House Bill 1390 from the table. Go with me. Sorry, guys. No. The motion before us is to remove House Bill 1390 from the table. Chair recognizes Representative Wolf to speak to his motion. Thank you. Right. If I know that I didn't have the opportunity to present the bill as I wanted, and if I know that what is written this, this. in the calendar is totally different than the floor amendment would make it, so, uh, so I am asking so if I know that by bringing this motion to the floor, I'm asking the opportunity to reconsider a tabling. There is, a, and look at the floor amendment. Thank you very much. I know I don't have a lot of time, so. Turn your seat. The chair recognizes Representative Speedy. Members need to be in your seats. Members need to be in your seats. We're in the voting mode. Chair, recognize Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that a strong bipartisan majority of this legislative body placed this bill on the table just mere hours ago, and Mr. Speaker, if I further know the underlying bill would destroy the culture present on countless New Hampshire lakes, would I now press the red button and keep this awful bill on the table where it belongs? Thank you. The House will be in order. The motion before us to remove House Bill 1390 from the table. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. While members present had an opportunity to vote, House will tend to stay to the vote. 165 voting nay, 188 voting nay. The motion fails. Representative Ouellette is recognized for a motion. State your motion. Uh, thank you, sir. After voting on the prevailing side, I'd like to reconsider House Bill 1863. 12. 
Uh, excuse me, 1283. Sorry. 1283. 1283. 1283. Sorry. House will be in order. Chair recognizes Representative Stapleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to support the reconsider of HB 1283. In Judiciary Committee, we worked a long time on this bill, both pro and con, and we received volumes of testimony at the hearings as well as via mail, email, and telephone. We also had a vote th that was differential only by three votes back on the 21st and late in the day. The bill before 1283 had about 373 members present. By the time this 1283 was voted on, about 430, we ended up with 355. So we had 17 or so members not present, maybe because of the one-minute rule, maybe because of people taking a break, who knows. But this bill <clears throat> must be considered, and it's important enough to consider, reconsider this bill so that we have all members present or all members have the opportunity to vote on this, especially those who are out of the hall on the 21st. This, is, this bill is so important that it can change life and law in the state of New Hampshire going forward. So I ask you to vote green for the reconsider so that we can give those members a chance to have a say and a vote that we're out of the chamber on the 21st. Thank you. Does the member yield to questions? Yes. Member yes. yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative. Uh, do you realize that Adolf Hitler started his, uh, his reign of terror with euthanasia? Uh, yes, I do realize that's a part of history recorded. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Vokala. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, I rise uh, to express my firm stance against this reconsideration of the medical aid and dying legislation. We have dedicated over an hour to thoughtful and impassioned speeches elucidating the significance of this issue and the profound impact that ha it has on the lives of our citizens. To attain another hour of debate would only be redundant but also disrespectful to the weightly de deliberations that have already taken place. While I'm committed to fostering an understanding, uh, understanding and continuing education on this matter, I am apprehensive that the additional discourse will sway those members who prioritize state control over individual autonomy, the right to make decisions regarding one's own life and end-of-life care should be subject, not subject to governmental interference, and it is imperative that we uphold the principles of personal freedom and dignity in matters as deeply personal as this. Therefore, I urge my esteemed colleagues to stand firm in their convic convictions and resist the call for re reconsideration. Let us honor the deliberative process that has brought us to this point and focus our efforts on advancing policies that uphold the fundamental rights and values of our constituents. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Pentonil.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that this matter is of, sorry, is of grave concern and that we owe it to our constituents to debate this one more time before we make a final decision, would I press the green button in support of reconsideration? Chair, recognize Representative Shirtliff. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, two weeks ago you had laryngitis, and you asked if I would give the Deputy Speaker a well-deserved break. And I was very happy to do it and to be back at the podium again brought back a lot of wonderful memories for me. A few days after that, I had a, a friend from the Republican caucus ask me a question. He said, Steve, you were up at the podium as Speaker. What would you do if there was a tie vote? Would you vote with us, the majority Republican, or would you feel obliged to vote with your Democratic colleagues? And I said, you know, that's really a wonderful question, but for me it's an easy question to ask. Um, you know, for eight years I was Democratic leader, and I always told our caucus at the end of our caucuses ad nauseum, that remember, you always vote your conscience, you always vote your district, and if you can, you vote your party. And so if we had a tie vote, I wouldn't necessarily vote with Democrats or Republicans. I'd vote what my conscience told me to do. When we took up this bill on the House floor, I struggled, like a lot of you here, on how to vote for moral grounds, religious reasons, and so many others. And when I walked into this chamber, I still wasn't sure how I was going to vote. We had an hours-long debate, and we had excellent speeches on both sides of the aisle and on both sides of the issue. One speak speech in particular resonated with me. And when the vote came, I pushed the red button. I voted no on this. As I said, we had an hour-long debate. We had excellent commentary from people on both sides of this question. But now is the time in the democratic process that this bill move on to the Senate so they can do what they can do. Mr. Speaker, my conscience is telling me now to vote no, and I hope your conscience is telling you the same thing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion before us is the reconsideration vote on 1283. A division has been requested by Representative Sweeney. Members take their seats. The motion before us is reconsideration. House will be in order. The motion before us is reconsideration on House Bill 1283. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Mooney for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good evening, members of the House. If I know that over 40 state representatives missed the vote on House Bill 1283, and if I know that there are members who voted and now expressed interest in re-voting, and lastly, if I know that we and our constituents deserve an accurate count of where we stand as a body, on this sensitive and important vote, despite the lateness of the hour, then would I press the green button on the motion to reconsider? Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Eaton for a parliamentary inquiry. 
Mr. Speaker, if I know just last week, we had a lengthy, spirited, informative, and very respectful debate on a very sensitive issue. Mr. Speaker, if I know that 1283 provides numerous guardrails for all persons involved, including the families. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the final vote was based on empathy, dignity, compassion, and a respect for personal, individual liberty. And finally, Mr. Speaker, if I know reconsider if reconsideration does occur, there are 11 speakers signed up. Would I now vote no to the pending motion? The motion before us is reconsideration on House Bill 1283. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, House will attend the state of the vote. 147 voting nay, yay, 110 voting nay. Reconsider motion fails. The chair recognizes the member from Auburn, Representative Osborne, for the third reading motion. Thank you. Resolve that the House now adjourn from the early session, that the business of the late session be in order at the present time, that the reading of bills be by title only and resolutions by caption only that all bills ordered to third reading be read a third time by this resolution, and that all titles of bills be the same as adopted, and that they be passed at the present time, and when the House adjourns today, it be to meet Thursday, April 11th at 10 a.m. The question is on the third reading motion. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. House recognizes a clerk for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A couple of quick announcements, if you would, please. This is an important announcement for not just you members, but for anybody watching. Materials, specific, specifically lobbying, pamphlets, handouts, etc., are not to be left in the anterooms of the House of Representatives. They can be passed out outside, but they are not to be left on tables without explicit permission of the Speaker of the House. Last, yesterday, we had two new members swear in. When I went to walk them to their new seats, there was a pile of candy wrappers on the floor behind somebody's seat. So please make sure, follow the leave no trace principles. Take it in, take it out with you. Next, this is a very important announcement. On behalf of the Krista McAuliffe uh, Memorial Statehouse um, uh, Commission, Tomorrow morning, there will be an announcement from the governor's office about an arts competition from the, for all students across the state of New Hampshire. Please pay attention to that so that students in your districts can participate. Lastly, our next session day, April 11th, we will celebrate the fantastic return of Tartan Day. Please wear your plaid. Thank you. Representative Osmond moves that the House stand in recess for the purpose of introduction of bills and roll bill amendment and roll bills report, vacate motion, receiving messages. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it. The House is in recess until Thursday, April 11th, 2024 at 10 a.m.